This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board, Wednesday, March 4th, 2027. Well, now 707, Town Room, Town Hall, Agenda. Okay, here we go. Now, item number one is minutes. We do have one set of minutes from the 29th of January. Uh, I see only uh, David, you weren't there, uh, but we have five other members. Did everyone review these minutes, and does anyone have um, any comments or corrections? Michael? Yeah. Uh, yes, on page three, um, the uh, final paragraph before uh, item B. Um, it, it says uh, the bid is offered to build a parking garage behind CVS and a band shell on the common. Um, I'm not sure that's exactly what was um, intended by um, Ms. Gould's um, comments. Uh, they're, they're certainly considering that. I'm not sure they're offering to actually do that at this point. Uh, and since, since Ms. Gould is here, perhaps she could... Um, Amplify that if that's appropriate. Well, could we just add the word proposed or? Uh, we actually haven't proposed it either. Uh, it was part of a five part uh, Destination Amherst presentation that was presented to the Town Council on January 23rd or 24th. Okay, um, that, that's good. Thank so, you. Yeah. So we're just doing the, the minutes here. So can we just um, strike that line or something? Suggested the possibility of? Uh, there you go. Uh, would that work to Again, make it? it was the town manager that suggested that. We were just part of the five part. Our parts were not that. That was from the well, town manager. Well, how about, how about, because you can't speak because you're not at the mic, oh, sorry. sorry. But let me just say, Chris, this was you speaking, so how about you just clarify what you were saying in the minutes? Because it wasn't like we had a presentation, the bid wasn't here or anything like that. It was just uh, Ms. Bestrup trying to report on what it says, provided an overview. Um, so you should just have that sentence reflect what you were saying. And if she did say that, well, then it would be an error, but it's what Ms. Bestrup was summarizing. So I think Mr. Gertwistle had an idea, which was I suggest, or the bid was suggested the possibility of building a parking garage. Is that okay? Yeah, the bid has Everybody? suggested the possibility of building. Oh. Okay, and <clears throat> Chris is comfortable with that. I think that solves the problem. Thank you, Michael. Anyone else have any other um, comments or corrections? I see none, so I'm waiting for a motion. Move to approve the minutes as amended. I need a second. Um, any more discussion? All good? Um, all in favor? Um, and I think that's unanimous for what's there. Great. And one. Yeah. Or would it be two abstentions? Yeah. All right. Um, great. So we'll move to. Um, item three, public hearings, site plan reviews, and special permits. Uh, it, it's um, 7-10, we'll do SPR 2020-05-462 Main Street, LLC, 42 Main Street, Center, East Commons, continued from January 15th, 2020 and February 5th, 2020. Request to modify previously issued site plan review approval, SPR 2020-01, to change the unit configuration on a mixed-use building to add more one bedroom and studio apartments and increase the number of units from 16 to 24. To increase the building footprint by approximately 800 square feet and the building size by a total of approximately 2,700 square feet. To adjust the location of certain site improvements to rebuild the back section of the existing office building and to request waivers of the parking requirements and modif uh, modifications requested so as to be in compliance with conditions one and seven of the decision for SPR 2020-01. B and zoning district, map 14B, parcel 68. And I just will um, add that there was a special permit with this, but that has previously been approved. So, um, Chris? Did you ask about public comment? before opening this public hearing? I 
didn't, and that's important. So if did I officially open this yet? Or is or can I put it on hold? I think you could put this on hold and ask if there are public comments about anything that's not on the agenda. And this is important because I wanted to state in public comment, this is where you can come up and um, I know I got thrown off because our guests were already Here up I and am. set up. Sorry. So I apologize to everyone. But this is when you can come forward and talk about something that's not on our agenda. And I want to bring up one thing in particular. Um, there was some miscommunication in the newspaper that this um, planning board meeting was going to discuss parking and parking um, specific changes to like bylaws or any and that's not on our agenda tonight so if anybody is here to talk about parking um, now would be the time to come forward um, a show of hands is there anyone here who would like to do public comment all right nope there isn't so that's good you don't have to move all right thank you so we'll go back to the public hearing and um, Ms. Bresser, is there anything you need to say, Chris, or should we just go straight to that? Okay. So I will just want to ask one more thing. Are there any board member disclosures? Um, though I do want to say, so should we mention at this time that we have one member who was not in attendance for the, was it the January 5th? Or February, February 5th that okay. Mr. Jemsek was um, not in attendance. And we're utilizing the Mullins rule. Um, so um, that has uh, been taken. Yeah, yeah, you can say. Yeah, I you. signed a statement there that I, I watched the video. Amherst Media. Thank you, Amherst Media. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So that means that you are eligible to vote um, on this hearing. So thank you. Um, I assume I am still ineligible to vote, correct? That's another good, yes. Um, Thank you. Because I don't think Mr. Marshall was a member of the planning board when this public hearing began. The January 15th is the one that was, but you were here, right. And feel free to ask questions and such. You just won't be able to vote at the, at the when we vote. So, thanks. Um, okay, so, all right. No other boards. Okay. So thank you. Now okay. you can Great. talk away. You brought us some information back. We and have. We have it in our packets. You do. So I guess for the record, uh, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Ms. Brestrup, Ms. Field Sadler. Uh, I'm Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst, here on behalf of 462 Maine. In its application, as the chairwoman noted, for the modification of the site plan review. With me this evening is the owner and manager of 462 Maine, John Robleski. Um, so we were here back in February. I think you sent us away with really two pieces of homework. Um, one of those was to um, take another look at the landscaping and screening of those front parking spaces and of the transformer, which we've done. And so there's a rendering um, either in front or behind you, whichever way you want to look, uh, showing um, the screening that we would be providing of both the transformer and those parking spaces. And then the other piece, <clears throat> excuse me, that we were going to talk about was, was the parking. And so I think you have in your packets, John, John put together a, a narrative essentially that includes a parking management plan, his experience, so basically his testimony based upon High Street. Um, and then he also went and collected data that I think he articulated to you verbally last meeting, but now he's got it in written form in an Excel spreadsheet that essentially um, the result of which suggests that the bedroom to parking uh, ratio of the actual cars there is around 60%, I think 61%. And John went out uh, last night or early this morning, I suppose, and uh, it was at 62%. So we we're right in that 60% range of what the, the actual bedrooms to the actual number of vehicles in the parking lot. And so that's what we were working with was that 60%. Um, for 35 beds at John's 462 Main Street development, even at 62%, which is that higher end, we need 22 spaces. And as, as you'll recall, we're proposing 32 spaces on the site. So we think, based on that data, and I think you also received a, a letter from an abutter um, supporting the request for the waiver, and we think that the data supports the waiver, and we think that we meet the requirements twofold, not only the, um, 
the sight, the aesthetics, and the, the, the safety, um, but also these are complementary uses. You've got the office space, and then you've got the residential spaces. And then John's also got a parking management plan, and that management plan, amongst other things, involves prohibiting five tenants from having vehicles. And while um, that is not specifically articulated in the bylaw as one of those requirements, as I read the bylaw, it says you shall provide for, but it's not limited to, you know, ride sharing, carpooling, PVTA, et cetera. And so we would suggest that given this location, um, and as John mentions in his narrative, this is in the downtown, um, with its proximity to the PVTA, right along a sidewalk, plus what we've seen as trends with vehicles, that the parking that he is providing is sufficient for the use on site. And so we would ask for your approval uh, as presented. We're obviously happy to have a conversation about any of this stuff. So at this time, I'll open it to the board for um, questions or comments. Uh, Maria? Um, th <clears throat> thank you for the rendering. It's, it's doing exactly what I was hoping for, which is basically, you know, not mask the building or the signage, but the cars. And um, so thank you for that. And, um, sure. and also, thank you for this. This is really useful for us and timely. We're going to be looking into the zoning bylaws regarding parking. And um, so, uh, yeah, we'll add this to our, we, we've been trying to get data ourselves, I think, and so we'll add this to our inventory, so sure. thanks. You know, and as, as part of that parking management plan, I think uh, 462 Maine would agree to do some sort of monitoring just to make sure that in fact, you know, there is not a parking problem and then obviously provide that data to the planning department for its use. Um, Janet, I saw your hand first, and then Jack. So, um, as you know, I'm not in favor of um, having leases without parking um, when there's a provision in the bylaw that it's two parking spaces per unit. So, this is this. Um, I do appreciate this spreadsheet because we need data, but this is a moment in time. So, I've gone out and looked a few times, and I was looking at um, 22 High Street, which has 12 units, and there were 28 cars in the parking lot, and so. How does that affect your calculus or understanding? And then I also went and on Sunday morning, I figured Sunday morning's a good time, try to get there early enough that people weren't gone. And I found several situations where there were 13 cars with a six, uh, in a um, building with six bedrooms, you know, bed, you know, six apartments. And so I was going along Main Street and on the south side where there's a lot of big buildings, the parking lots were almost full um, they're like large houses, they're dirt um, parking lots. And so I have information here that shows that there's more than, you know, one, you know, parking space per unit being used. So are we supposed to base um, the use of this building over time, over decades, based on one day? Is that reasonable to you? And then is it unreasonable for me to say, listen, I saw 28 cars on a 12-unit building, so we should realize that and there was enough parking in the lot because there actually are 34 spaces so I guess two responses I I mean I think 4 30 a.m. on a Wednesday morning is probably a more accurate representation of of, of what the um, use is going to utilize than a Sunday morning um, and Sunday mornings are likely to have guests or visitors stay over because it's the weekend I think the practical effect would be if there's not parking for guests, guests aren't going to park. And so if we're concerned about tenants and leases and having spaces for the folks who occupy it, I think the reality is, and it's somewhat of a business decision uh, by Mr. Robleski, that guests will have to find another means of transportation. And whether it's an Uber or a Lyft or a bicycle or a scooter or PVTA, I think if, if the parking is there, yeah, it, it may get filled up but we don't think that it's needed you know, for this use. So my relatives come and visit me and they bring two cars, where do they park? Do they Uber from Boston or New York? I mean, I don't, I don't understand this. But, it's like- But why, why does John need to think about that? I think it should be something that the tenant thinks about when they're finding a place to live and say, boy, I have visitors come in from Boston or New York. 
Where are they going to park? Oh, this isn't the right housing for me. And I, and I think it's as simple, I think it's as simple as that. Jack? Um, just from the, the last presentation, um, there's discussion about the, the bus line being overcrowded. And I was just wondering about the PVTA and that there was some suggestions of communications being made to them. And I was just wondering where that stands in terms of this responsiveness a PVTA to provide adequate ridership where there's a demand. Yeah, I did touch base um, with the fellow, uh, Alex Forrest, and he's in charge of, I think, the route planning and so forth in Springfield for the PVTA. And he realizes that Route 30, which starts out at uh, Old Belchertown Road by the old landfill, stops at a number of apartment complexes. And I relayed to the board at that meeting that uh, one of my tenants from High Street had walked across 462 Main to the bus stop, couldn't get on because it was full. Had to go back and he got a skateboard and went to UMass. But Alex Forrest um, said they're aware of that and he appreciated that I was relaying the information that there's you know a, a new, new uh, apartment place going on Southeast Street with possibly 57 units there as part of the route and now possibly another 35 bedrooms being added here. So he says, yeah, we have to work on that and we're gonna increase the capacity uh, of this Route 30 or divide it up some way. So they are aware of it. What they're gonna do, you know, probably depend, depends on their funding and so forth, however they operate. But I don't know, if, um, does BID get involved with anything on that? We have been. So I think it's you know a town effort, PVTA effort, probably Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, UMass, all working together. Um, any other questions from the board? <clears throat> I don't see any at this time. I'm gonna open it up for questions to the public. Is there anyone here? Can I see a show of hands who would have a question to ask about this project? Mm, I see, oh, I have one. Feel free to come up, sir. One of these gentlemen will free up a seat. <clears throat> so say your name and, and street so the minute takers right, can get so it. So I am uh, Frederick Griffiths, 21 Gray Street. I'm an abutter. Mm -hmm. I also have a letter from other abutters. May I read it? Sure. Okay. Uh, so first that uh, from Rob Oaken, O-K-U-N and 80 BMAC, B-E-M-A-K. Uh, who were at 33 Gray Street. Uh, they were unable to come tonight. They had hoped to, so they sent me an email. I can give you a copy of this. Thank you. Uh, so to the planning board, we live adjacent to the new apartments John Robleski is proposing to build. While we couldn't be with you this evening, we feel strongly about the issue before you. Mr. Robleski has been courteous, responsive, and thoughtful in his relations with neighbors throughout the planning and construction of the new units. We have been neighbors to the existing apartments on High Street and have only the highest regard for how he has managed his property. Uh, speaking specifically about the parking lot for the new apartments, we support Mr. Robleski's position. Not only does the data support the contention of the number of spaces needed, he has demonstrated his intention to be a good steward of the land surrounding the parking area, leaving and enhancing green space, maintaining decades old trees, and constructing a building that will be beneficial for its tenants and neighbors alike. At a time when more and more people are reducing the numbers of cars they drive and increasing their use of public transportation, we want to go on record as enthusiastically endorsing Mr. Robaleski's parking plan, ADB Mac and Rob Okun. And I, I would agree with all of that so personally. Uh, Mr. Robleski has been a very good steward. I have uh, lived through the whole uh, life cycle of the high street unit and it's been very well managed and he's been very forthright with the neighborhood as he has in the planning. Uh, a particular concern to me with the added parking uh, spaces, if we want to go from 32 to 35, is you lose two mature maples, which is the only landscaping in the middle of that block, which is a major problem in the neighborhood. And the time I have lived in that neighborhood, which is 40 years, um, about half the trees have disappeared in various ways. It's getting quite denuded. And that would be a major loss. That's what the middle of this block in terms of amenities. So for those three extra parking lots, that would be a very large loss for all of us. 
But otherwise, I do support the uh, petition for you know the, the revision of the site plan. Mr. Robleski has been very straightforward with us. Has been a considerate neighbor, and he manages things you know quite well. So thank you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Are there any? Oh, it's best right. Um, do we have a copy of that letter? Oh. <laughs> Is there anyone else here who would like to speak on this hearing? State your name and uh, welcome. Gabrielle Gould, uh, representing the Downtown Amherst Business Improvement District Board. Um, John's parcel is in our bid district and a part of our downtown and what we consider an integral part of our downtown. Um, I don't think a lot of people understand the district lines and how far they do go on a couple of different directions. Um, we were really excited to hear about this project uh, when it was first brought to me. Um, this is an opportunity to create more residential density within walking distance to the core center of our business district, which is always exciting for us. But also we have several businesses down on Main Street and the density of this apartment dwelling and you know others that could be proposed for down in that area is really um, something that we're looking forward to, uh, especially with a new restaurant hopefully coming online in 2021. Um, these, these are businesses that deserve more foot traffic. Also, um, again, absolutely within walking distance to downtown, but that PVTA stop right there is such a, a wonderful natural transition. And as I stated earlier, we are in talks with the PVTA. We do know that some of the routes are getting overcrowded and we are talking to them. So it's not just coming from one person with a parcel, it's coming from several different business owners as well. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak on this? I see none, so I'll bring it back to the board. Um, and if there's any comment the applicant wants to add to those comments? Or... No, I think it's well stated, and it's not so often that you have a couple of abutters come out to support a project that's looking to increase density over what it was. So I, I, I mean, I think that's pretty telling. Um, you know, one of the folks did mention extra parking and so what John did was put together what a, a reserved parking plan we would call it. Um, we could get an additional six spaces in there but that comes at the sacrifice of a couple of really nice old trees. And so we would prefer not to do that. Uh, we think that the parking that we have is sufficient. Um, I know I need five votes. I don't know where on the board I'm gonna get them. So, uh, I guess we'll, we'll see where it ends up, but um, I mean, this reserved parking is always something to consider if a, if a board member is set against voting in favor of exactly what we have. And if they wanted us to come back at some, you know, 12 months from our certificate of occupancy and wanted to revisit the parking at that time and say if it hasn't worked after we've collected the data and it's proved that it doesn't um, work, then they could say, this, that board could say, okay, now we want you to put in these spaces. Ideally, it wouldn't happen, but just know that that's somewhat of a release valve if that's what gets some of the members over the edge to vote in favor of this. So I think other than that, I'll keep my mouth shut. So it, like we're saying, there's trees there and such, and you don't want to take them down, and we just heard that from some neighbors. Um, uh, trees do have a lifespan, and down the road, it, this is part of your parking management that, you know, if there are, if there shows a need, even though trends are showing that as we look at this 10, 20 years down the road, if anything, less parking will be needed. But it's good to have that kind of safety buffer there for some other options. Um, again, does the, I see one hand, any other question? Okay, so Janet? On the issue of reserve parking, did you, have you talked to any of the, um, property owners across the street, like the VFW or the Red Barn, or there's a lot of unused space at night. Um, so if people are having people guests over or visiting, they won't be forced to move out of their apartment or put them in the, a, a no parking zone. I was wondering if that, that to me is a very appealing option. And so I, it seems easier than taking trees down is to have the space available. And that, you know, my concern isn't that this is going to be a poorly run building, so I'm sure it will be, especially under your management, but you know, 10, 20 years down the line, we don't know, 
but also I'm really concerned that this building works for the tenants without them being forced not to have a car if they need it or if they get a car, a job with a car, they have to move out I mean, in a, a town when there's hardly any apartments available. I don't understand that thinking, but I'm just wondering, I'm always, I'm looking for the alternative and I see a lot of blacktop across the street at night. Yeah, um, I don't know if you read the paper, but the VFW is kind of closing down. They served their last drink there, so there's no more functions or whatever going to go on there. So I, I would assume at some point it's going to transition to some other use. Um, we do have that letter, if you remember, in the beginning from the VFW for contractor parking there. Um, the Red Barn, I'm not sure who owns that. I haven't really dealt with them, but my property on Lower Main Street at 734 abuts the Jewish Community Center there. And when we have a big storm or something or like graduation parties, I always call them and say, look, at, we might have like six or eight extra cars. You mind if they park in the back of your lot? you know, just for the day or to clear snow, that type of thing. And we've always kind of worked together on that. So yes, I suppose I could, you know, contact somebody in that red barn. Is that owned by the architect? One of the architects there? I'm well, not sure, but I can look it up. There's also the Amtrak station. Yeah. So I can certainly look into that. So that's good to hear that you're open. I mean, I think what you're really um, harping on is it's good communication. And you know yeah. you are local, and you know the people who live around, and the opportunity for the future. You could always have some shared parking agreements, yeah. especially where you're so close it's to the downtown. neighborhood working together. You know, there are we're, parking we're plopping lots that the are building empty. in somebody's backyard, basically. So, and that's what we did on Main Street. We rehabbed the three-family building there, and you know, paved the parking lot, took a big tree down that was an old willow tree, and you know, people were appreciative of that. And. <laughs> So yeah, it's a matter of the neighborhood working together. Thank you. Are there any other questions, Michael? Uh, this is more a point of, point of information. Um, I didn't realize until a few days ago that the property under consideration was part of the bid. Um, is the VFW across from the street also part of the bid? I believe it is. Well, I think part of their par parking lot is. I looked at it at one time. It crosses the railroad. Sorry, first. the big edge of the railroad. It, right. It, so right either, here. Can you repeat that? You, or she has to come up and say it. So it, sure. Um, the bid ends, if you follow this purple cursor across the street, a screen, it ends at the railroad track. So everything to the west is within the bid, everything to the east is yeah, within. Actually, the, the railroad right away is in bid. <laughs> yeah. Are they paying? I don't think they'll let me park there, though. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. And actually, I'm maybe, Chris, you probably know, where does the um, downtown does not require the developers to um, include the any municipal parking, parking district? The municipal parking district. Yeah. That's only a block or two away. Chris? The municipal parking district is really confined to the BG and the BL surrounding mm -hmm. the BG, so it doesn't come down in this direction. But I think there but it's is within a walking distance. Yeah, that's on street parking. I think there's on street parking a lot, like on Gray and High Street, other than during a snowstorm. Gray and High Street. Say that again. I but think there is on street parking allowed on both yeah. Gray Street and High Street. There is. Probably not. Not we on Triangle Street. Used to have the street. winter parking ban, but we no longer have that. Yeah, just when the lights flashing. Right, just when the lights are flashing. Um, Janet? So there isn't parking allowed along High Street until you get a bit of the ways um, um, past the railroad. Um, yeah. north. It, it, you have to go up a bit. But so there. to me, it seems like you could talk to the Red Barn people. Um, the person, there's a business that owns the Amtrak station that's very lightly used even during the day. So I would be, would you be interested in contacting them and could continue the hearing and see if those? I think the. Um the railroad station is owned by the railroad. That would be it's it's owned by a friend of mine. So, the bill, but not all that land that's there. That's the parking lot. But Chris, you could. Um, I think that it gets a little complicated because yeah. if you start parking um, sort of in a permanent way on land that doesn't belong to you, then you have to deal with. Um, off-site parking and get permits for that so the people who would allow you to park on their property would have to get 
some kind of a permit to allow that to happen. So it's not as easy as it sounds right. on the face of things. Even a shared parking agreement has to have legal documents drawn up. But the whole point is it is possible. And if you were having a problem with right. parking, right. The, there are options. That's what's Correct. the point, Correct. I think, that yeah. there are yes. options mm -hmm. to be able to find more parking and fix the situation if it ever became yeah, I mean, a problem. If my tenants are having issues, then I try to deal with them, you know, so their life is happy right. and my <laughs> life is happy. We want everybody to be happy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Are there any other questions? David? Uh, no, I don't have a question. Uh, yeah. uh, I would like to thank Mr. Robusti. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd like to thank Mr. Rupp for the rework and for the data, the, the going around at 4.30 in the morning. I hope that, that's not a regular <laughs> yeah, I was there this morning trip too. for you. <laughs> um, and then I'd like to move to close the public hearing, and then I'd, I'd, I'd be willing to make a motion to um, approve the request for the waiver or the mo modification of the parking requirements and um, as presented today, um, uh, approve the site plan. Okay, so we have a motion. Is there a second? second. Thank you. Um, at this time, we can um, debate or discuss the option on the table. Or are we ready to vote? Chris? Would you like to review conditions and findings before you vote? We could. If we're that close, I just, uh, other, does anyone have any other questions besides that, or can I read the findings? Yeah, Doug. I have no other questions. I, since I won't be able to vote, I thought I would at least inform you that were I able to vote, I would probably vote in favor. Thank you for that. Okay, I see no hands, so um, I'm, I'll review the draft findings first. We have those in our packet. Um, so the board found under section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw, site plan review as follows. And if you um, have a comment to add on these, the board members, um, raise your hand or sort of, um, Call out a little because I'll be looking at the paper. 11.2400, the project is in conformance with all appropriate provisions of the zoning bylaw. 11.2401, town amenities and abutting properties will be protected through minimizing detrimental or offensive actions. The proposed use of the property, residential and office uses, is unlikely to create a detrimental or offensive action. These uses are both allowed in the BN zoning district by site plan review. 11, yes, Grimo. Yes. Oh. Um, sounds good. That was on the first line, 2400. Yeah. Do you... Um, Go ahead, Janet. So um, when you make a waiver, do you present findings about how it met, met the waiver standards? You can, if you would like to. Yep. Do we have, where's the part? I don't have anything written about that, but you can certainly yeah. discuss that. Okay. Um, so 11.2402, abutting properties will be protected from detrimental site characteristics resulting from proposed use. Lights will be downcast and or shielded. 11.2403, provision of adequate recreational facilities, open space and amenities have been addressed because there is adequate space on the site for recreation. 11.2410, Unique and important natural, historic, and scenic features will be protected. The Historical Commission has reviewed the proposed demolition of the garage and has imposed a 12-month demolition delay on the removal of the garage. The historic building <clears throat> that now houses offices will be retained except for the rear shed, which will be removed and replaced with a new structure. A special permit has been granted for the alteration of the existing non-conforming uh, structure. 11.2411. The project provides adequate methods of refuse disposal as described in the management plan. Trash will be collected in an enclosed structure at the rear of the existing building and will be picked up by the Amherst Trucking uh, twice weekly. 
Doesn't Amherst Trucking have a new name? USA Waste. Thanks. So. I think I did change that in my. Oh, in your plan. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Eleven point two four one two. The project will be connected to town sewer and water, and the town engineer has reviewed and has not expressed concerns about the town services or their ability to serve the proposed use. 11.2413, the proposed drainage system within and adjacent to the site will be adequate to handle the stormwater. The town engineer has reviewed and not, has not expressed concerns about the proposed stormwater management system. 11.2414, provisions of adequate landscaping have been addressed and the project includes new plantings on site as well as preservation of some of the existing mature trees. 11.2415, the soil erosion control methods are con uh, considered adequate to control soil erosion both during and after construction. 11.2416, adjacent properties will be protected by minimizing the intrusion of various nuisances. A construction logistics plan is required to be submitted prior to the issuance of a building permit. 11.2417, adjacent properties will be protected from the intrusion of lighting because a condition of the permit requires that existing lighting be downcast and or shielded and not shine onto adjacent properties. 11.2418 and 11.2419, um, not applicable. 11.2420, the planning board did not choose to refer to, uh, the, uh, refer to the design principles and standards set for it in section 3.3040 and 3.2041 of the zoning bylaw because the planning board members determined that the project was well designed and fit well into the surrounding neighborhood. 11.2421, the development is reasonably consistent with respect to setbacks, placement of the parking, landscaping, entrances, exits, with surrounding buildings and development. The development complies with the dimensional requirements of the zoning bylaw. 11.2422, not applicable. 11.2423, there is more than one building on the site and the buildings relate harmoniously to each other in architectural style, site location, and building exits and entrances. 11.2424, screening has been provided as appropriate via a fence along the western and northern property lines and via landscaping at the front of the property. 11.2430, the site has been designed to provide for the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement both within the site and in relation to adjoining ways and properties. The parking lot has been carefully designed to allow backup and turning movements and pedestrian circulation and a condition of the permit will require that vegetation at the entrance drive be trimmed to improve site distance along Main Street. 11.2431, the existing curb cut on the property will be retained and improved. 11.2432, the location and design of the parking spaces, bike racks, drive aisles, loading areas, and sidewalks have been provided in a safe and convenient manner. 11.2433, 11.2434, and 35 are all not applicable. 11.2436, the requirement for submittal of a traffic impact statement has been waived. However, the applicant did submit a statement from the FA Heska, Hesk and Associates, Inc. with estimated trip generation figures. 11.2437, not applicable. So those are the findings. I think everybody's good with those. Um, then if we go to the draft conditions, um, I'm going to have a bit of water before I start this one. <laughs> okay, general draft conditions. Uh, first section, general 14 items. Number one, development shall be built substantially in accordance with the plan submitted to the planning board and approved on whatever date that is. Um, in substantial field changes may be approved by the building commissioner. Two, the development shall be managed substantially in accordance with the management plan submitted to the planning board and approved on the date. Oh, Chris, just so you know, these are misnumbered. So um, there's actually 15, <coughs> I think. But so this, it will be three. Uh, parking shall be um, managed substan uh, substantially in accordance with the parking management plan submitted to the par uh, planning board and approved on the date. So number four, 
uh, upon a change of ownership or if the property is no longer managed by John uh, Wobleski, the new owner and or manager shall submit a new management plan to the planning board at a public meeting for its review and approval. The purpose of the meeting shall be for the board to determine whether conditions of the permit are being complied with or whether any modifications of the site plan review, approval, or management plan is required. Number five, a sign plan shall be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval at the public meeting prior to the installation of the new signs. Existing signs have been approved as proposed. Number six, all exterior light shall be dark sky compliant. Exterior lighting shall be downcast shielded and shall not shine onto the adjacent properties or streets. Seven, this property shall be registered and permitted in accordance with the Amherst Residential Rental Property Bylaw. Loss or suspension of a rental permit shall um, constitute a violation of this condition. Um, number, eight. number eight, changes to the project and or substantial changes to any approved site plans or to the exterior of the building shall be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval prior to the work taking place. The purpose of the submittal shall be for the planning board to approve the change and or to determine whether the changes are de minimis or significant enough to require modification of the special permit or the site plan uh, review approval. <clears throat> oh, now we're back on to correct numbers. Uh, so number nine, landscaping shall be installed in accordance with the landscape plan and once installed shall be continually maintained. All disturbed areas shall be loomed, seated, and other, uh, unless otherwise specified. Number 10, one hard copy and one digital copy of the final revised plan shall be submitted to the planning board. 11, the office space shall be available to be rented by a member of the public and shall not be used solely as the management office for the proposed mixed-use building. Is that actually true? I had no idea. Remember, hmm. um, 12, shrubs and vegetation that block the site distance on the east side of the drive, uh, driveway entrance shall be cleared. 13, the applicant shall install an electric vehicle charging station with two charging ports. Is it two or three? Is two. it two? Okay. Uh, 14, applicant will investigate the installation of solar panels and install solar panels if feasible. Construction section number 15. Prior to the issuance of any building permit, a pre construction meeting shall be scheduled with the applicant, the applicant's contractor, the town engineer, the building commissioner, the superintendent of public works, planning staff, the fire chief, and any other per staff personnel that may have a role in the construction of this project. 16. A written construction fire management plan shall be submitted to the fire chief and building commissioner prior to the issuance of a building permit. 17. Construction logistics plan shall be provided at the pre-construction meeting and shall cover the following items. A, construction timeline and expected completion dates for each phase. B, location of parking for contractors. C, location of on-site and off-site staging, such as for construction vehicles, including cement trucks. D, location of fencing around the construction site. E, details and locations of directional, marketing, and job signs related to construction. F, emergency contact information such as name and cell phone numbers of the developer and the contractor. G, information about construction signs including advertising signs for contractor, developer, and architect. H, the company affiliation, name, address, and business telephone number of the construction superintendent who shall have the overall responsibility for construction activities on the project site. I, proof that DigSafe has been notified at least 72 hours prior to the start of any site work. J, any other relevant information that they may request. 18, the construction logistics plan shall be subject to the following conditions. Construction A, construction activity shall occur only between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday to Saturday unless written consent is provided by the chief of police. Interior construction activity may be allowed on Sunday if written consent is provided by the chief of police. B, parking for contractors shall be restricted to the project site unless written permission is submitted to the building commissioner for parking elsewhere. There shall be no parking or idling of construction trucks or equipment in any public right of way. D, any blasting or hammering of rock or material shall be, uh, shall be noticed to town officials and abutters 24 hours in advance and completed between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. 19, as part of the building permit application, the applicant shall provide the building commissioner the name, address, business telephone number, and the pro project manager 
uh, or on-site manager who shall be responsible for all activities on the project site. 20, there shall be no exterior construction activity including fueling of vehicles on the project site before 7 a.m. or after 7 p.m., Monday through Saturday unless written consent is provided by the Chief of Police. There shall be no construction on the project site on the following legal holidays. New Year's Day, Memorial Day, Fourth uh, July 4th, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. The applicant agrees that the hours of operation shall be enforced by the Amherst Police Department and or inspection services. 21, the project site shall be fenced during construction. 22, appropriate measures shall be taken to control dust, dirt, debris, and other construction materials on site. 23, prior to and during construction, physical barriers should be installed to provide tree protection along the limits of the clearing line. Erosion controls and tree protection measures shall be continuously maintained throughout the course of construction. 24, all catch basins shall be protected from soil and debris contamination during construction and shall be cleaned at the end of construction. 25, no stumps, demolition material, or construction debris shall be buried or disposed of at the project site. 26, the town engineer and the building commissioner shall inspect the construction of the entry driveway and all on-site paved areas for the conformance of town standards. 27, the applicant shall provide as-built drawer plans, sorry, as-built plans as shown on building locations, grades, access ways, parking areas, and sidewalks and walkways, curbing, stormwater management facilities, lighting and utilities to the building commissioner, town engineer, and to be placed with the site plan review decision in the planning department. 28. The final certificate of occupancy shall not be issued until A, the final top coat of paving for all driveways and access areas, sidewalks and berms has been completed, B, landscaping as shown on the plan of record has been installed, and C, as built plans have been submitted to the building commissioner and the town engineer by all design professionals for the site, and the building construction has been approved by the building commissioner and town engineer. Okay. Ooh. Yes, Doug. So I'm hoping I'm still in my honeymoon period and I can ask what may be stupid questions. I have two questions. First is why number 14 is necessary. Uh, it doesn't seem related to the site, uh, the site plan in, at all. And then my second question is about the entire section <coughs> following that started with the word construction and why that is part of a special permit rather than just one of the town's regulations for doing any project in town. Seems like a project as of right would want to be following those things rather than only when we do a site plan review. Thank you. And I'd have less to read, but <laughs> yeah. So in answer to the first um, question about item 14, I think the applicant um, stated in perhaps in response to a question from one of the board members that he would investigate the use of solar panels. So this is going to encourage him to investigate and um, remind him to do so. Um, but if it's not feasible, he's not forced to do it. So that's the answer to that one. And the other one about the construction um, conditions, I was just thinking as we were reading through them that those would be great conditions to include in the zoning bylaw when we rewrite mm -hmm. it. For this type of building, these are the conditions that you have to follow. And then we wouldn't have to do this for each mixed use building that we encounter. So that's a good question. These are peculiar to mixed use buildings? Other well, types can be con constructed on Sundays? I mean, it, it seems like any construction project would want to follow pretty much everything here. You'd think. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. I shouldn't have limited it to mixed use buildings. It's really any large project. So when we get into rewriting the zoning bylaw, the building commissioner will be able to help us to determine which buildings this type of thing should be applicable to. Obviously, it wouldn't be applicable to a single family, or maybe aspects of this would be applicable to a single family. But um, currently, we don't really have any other way of um, making sure that all of these things happen. And we have run into situations where buildings are being built, and this was a couple of years ago, people weren't doing any of these things, and it really caused a lot of problems for the town. So the building commissioner has been suggesting in the last year or so that the planning board incorporate these conditions into the decisions so that people are all aware of them ahead of time. 
Thank you for asking that. It does beg the question of what happens on as of right projects, you know, that don't need to come through any review and don't True. we simply have regulations for how to build in Amherst? And does Maybe some not. Of this get tied into the when you're pulling a building permit? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, we have the expert on this in the room right now we, if you we wanted do. to really ask that question. <laughs> do we want him to come up or <laughs> If, if you have anything to add, <laughs> please introduce yourself. Rob Moore, Building Commissioner. So we do not have any general bylaws or anything that would uh, cover this type of activity overall for all activities. Uh, as far as the, um, the only thing that's regulated is a 7 to 7 work uh, time, Monday through Saturday, mm -hmm. and that's handled by the police department through general laws, Massachusetts general laws, not town bylaws. Thank you. <laughs> it's not a perfect system, Doug. <laughs> um, Chris. I wanted to ask if you wanted to add a, a condition about um, the applicant coming back in a year or two to review their parking plan, the number of spaces they have, and whether or not it would be worthwhile to investigate using the reserved parking spaces. Would that be agreeable? It would yep, be a great that's idea. Fine. I think we're, yep. it's not a mandatory thing, but I would love to see this become more of a norm. I think it's a good idea. Janet? So I was wondering, um, when you were reading the conditions, if the planning board separately approves the um, parking management plan, or is it, is it, how does that work? I think you can approve all of it altogether. You don't have to you know, approve each thing that's been submitted. So, oh, right. I mean, normally you submit the man you you approve the management plan, the site plans, whatever waivers have been requested. You know, so you sort of do a blanket approval. If you wanted to split it up, you could split it up, but that's not what you've traditionally done. Okay. Thank you, um, Michael. Uh, reference to uh, number four about the sign plan. Um, is it our expectation that? Uh, a change in individual building occupancy that would be reflected on a new placard on the existing large sign would have to come back to the planning board. I would hope that's not the, not the case. Yeah. I think the idea is they have an existing sign that they're proposing to use, and if they change out names of particular uh, tenants, that wouldn't come back. But if they change the whole look of the sign and the like, placement, et cetera, then they would have to come back. It's more about the structure of the sign. Great. Okay. Good question. And the lighting and okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions on the findings or conditions? Any other um, speak now or should we move to a vote? Oh, Janet, I see a hand. So, um, I'm I'm very unfond of the idea of telling tenants they can't park. And so <clears throat> we talked about this with the Southeast Commons is that if the parking is sufficient on the site for 24 units, um, then we don't need to assign spaces to people and there won't be any problem, right? And so there's kind of, there's 35 bedrooms, there's 32 spaces. If, I don't think that's sufficient, but I'm wondering if the parking management plan could be opened up where it's not a lease condition, you know, if the members of the board think that this is enough parking for 24 units, then I don't think it has to be in the lease. And the parking management plan could also say collecting data in, in a way that's described, like, you know, we'd like to know the highs and the lows, and then to come back if more parking is needed and seek it, you know, alternative parking across the street. And so that way this plan would have some um, flexibility and a little bit of control by the planning board saying, okay, we, you know, guessed, as you said last time, we're guessing what the units are, what, how many parking spaces per unit, the guest was wrong, so we need to provide those tenants with the spaces they need, and the parking management provides that you go forth and find your special permit and talk to the Red Barn or whoever and find spaces. So I, w I was just wondering if the management plan could be altered to be more flexible, um, require an update, you know, you know, keeping track of how it's being used if you're able to get people on buses or van pools, and then if it's not working, to, to seek you know, overflow parking area. 
I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. I mean, they have submitted a parking management plan, and then we're asking them to come back a year later and just, but to me, that's not about providing data. It's they're going to say whether it's working or it's not working, and if it wasn't working what they did, they're not actually going to do like a report. They're just going to kind of report back to us on whether or not it, it's working. And if it isn't working, well, it's their, their job to fix it. Well, in the waiver section, it says periodic documentation of reductions in vehicle trips and parking utilization as a result of the parking management plan may be required as a condition of any permit granted under this section. So I was thinking, first thing, don't exclude people from having parking through their leases and then give them some flexibility that they may need a car and maybe someone doesn't need a car. Um, so if it's sufficient, it's sufficient. You don't have to prevent from people from having um, cars and leases. Then requiring documentation, you know, figure out is this working? And then if it's not working in the management plan or in the conditions of the <coughs> permit, come back, come back with a different plan that provides the parking, parking that's needed. Well, I'm still not quite sure. The periodic that's stated in there, I thought what we're saying is the periodic is that in one year they're to come back and tell us whether or not it's working. And the part in their plan, they're already saying that they're going to have units that will opt to not have parking. And if that situation was to change, which you're worried about, I assume they will go to their landlord and the owner and they'll discuss it and work it out. Yeah. So, like, I don't think we're trying to get into the the what ifs of tenant owner relations. I mean, this we've heard nothing but this is a very reasonable owner and good manager. So we, so what is it you would want to change specifically? Or I guess that's I want to get it more specific. What are you actually asking for? So in the parking management plan, I would suggest that it's just the parking spaces are available for tenants as they need. Um, a requirement or an agreement in the plan to collect data, you know, on the high, you know, the, the uses. I'm not sure how quite to, to word that. And then as a condition that um, if the parking is insufficient, that the owner find overflow parking space and arrange for it somewhere, off-site off parking as a condition. I'm still not exactly sure what, I mean, I. How often do you want them to, I mean, we'd have to spell all that out in the plan, how often you want them to collect data. I'm comfortable at this point that if they come back a year from now and tell us how it's working and the general numbers of what's in their lot, that it would be informative. I mean, we're just, Jack? Um, to me, it, it seems like it's, it should be self-directed by the, the tenant-landlord relationship and the tenants are already going to be occupying there with, with an understanding of their parking, and if their life changes, they're probably not going to renew the lease, I mean, because they, they have different parking things. So I see, I see this as, as, you know, being for the right kind of people, and the lease ends, and there's an opportunity for that person to get a more comfortable parking situation, and there will be some other potential tenant that would come in that, that desires everything that this proposed development has, and, and they march forward like that, versus the effort of trying to accommodate someone that doesn't necessarily fit into that particular living arrangement as proposed by the developer. Michael? Uh, do you expect to have a rent adjustment for people who do not get have access to a parking space? I guess if there was a problem that developed, you know, and we had not enough parking, then I would throw that out. I think I mentioned that in the last management plan that that was an option. So I mean, the bottom line is I would try to work something out and make everybody accommodate whatever their needs are. But uh, according to the parking plan that you've submitted, uh, some space, some apartments will not be able to have a parking space. Well, some tenants versus some tenants will not apartment. Be yeah. to have a parking Looking at space. the bedroom situation. Yes. Uh, should those tenants be uh, subject to a reduction in their rent? Well, and I think if not, lot, why not? No, because a lot of this, I think, is going to happen 
the way it's been happening over the past quite a few years now next door is I don't know if they have a car until I get their application. It's not something that's asked on the application. Well, it is a question on the application, but that's not how you can screen somebody. So I can say that over the past eight years that the number of cars next door on High Street has gone down quite a bit. And it's been consistent. Now I just rented, as I mentioned in that narrative, I got two units turning over the end of May. There are six cars with those two units. There's um, seven bedrooms between those two units. And now there's going to be four cars because one, three bedroom units being rented by an individual who's a consultant and he's using it for office area. And he's got one car. And the four bedroom unit is going to have three cars. So that's another reduction of two vehicles starting in June. So I think what's going to happen is when I see the applications and they say they're not going to have a car, I will have a discussion with them and say, okay, you're not going to have a car during this term. Are you agreeable to waive this right to the parking space? Not that they have a right to the parking space, but I think that's how it's going to work is they're going to put on their application. They don't have a car. So if I could, it sounds like it happens organically. And if there's an issue where it's, he needs to reduce parking, then I think there would be a rent reduction accordingly when he needed to reduce parking. But I don't know that he would go and offer it and say, if you don't have a car, then you're not going to have parking. That just opens up too many management issues. And then if well, I could. Would it open up more management issues than simply having this addendum to lease that you're proposing, which is, is a signed statement that they will not have a car during the term of their lease? Uh, it seems to me that if you're asking people to sign a statement which pro prohibits them from having an automobile parked on your premises during the term of their lease, then there ought to be some kind of uh, rent reduction because everybody else has the opportunity to have a car parked on that place, except those f five people or however many yeah, units it is. It's an individual decision on their part. You know, they're applying for an apartment without a car. If that changes, you know, when they ask for one at some point, then we would address it then. Maybe I could just talk about the data collection for a second. I mean, we know we're going to be back in a year, and we know what the expectation is at that year mark. So I think naturally we are going to keep data to make sure that we are able to come to you and say in the first month, in the second month, in the third month, in the fourth month, here's what it was like. So I don't, you know, I don't know that we have to, I think it's built in, again, organically to what your condition is, that these are the types of things that we're going to do in anticipation of that 12-month date from the certificate of occupancy. And there's, you know, going to be exterior cameras. You know, that's the whole thing now is you've got to have cameras pretty much everywhere. So we'll have, you know, video monitoring basically and be able to see different times of day you know, what the in and out is. When is this building anticipated to be done? like open? Realistically, probably not till next spring. So it wouldn't be for a whole nother year from that. that well, we're saying a year from the Right, I'm just trying to get everyone in their head that yep. it's not actually yeah. a year from you now. You want to get it's kind of like that locked, first turnover. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, it would be two to three years away before we'd actually get this data. But. And um, and the bylaw may be changed I by mean, then anyways. Data is king. So if there was more <laughs> data, great. But at this point, the way we have it written um, is that you would come back a year later with yes. mm -hmm. the summary of how you're parking. And I think, you know, lessons learned happens over the year. And then the hope is that you're saying that it's enough, it's working, it's fine. And if it isn't, this is what we've done to adjust it. And it could... You've got a, a bunch of different options on the table here that you could, mm -hmm. right. could do good to, ideas to solve that around, problem. Yeah. But um, just, um, I just want to say, I, I, you know, there is a point where it is their choice not to have a car, and then they sign this agreement, and they're one-year leases. So if someone then at the end of a year said, I do want to get a car, um, you would make that work or you just change Yeah, I it? mean, most likely, like Tom said, it's going to happen because another tenant may come in and they're, they don't want a car. So I think there's going to be that balance effect that has been taking place next door. And even on Main Street, my three-apartment building on Lower Main Street, this morning when I was there at 430, 
there was only five cars parked there, and I have 10 bedrooms there. And that's been going down. You know, years ago, it's been pretty much 10. And now there's only eight cars listed to the tenants there. I think February, that morning I went there, there was six. And so this morning, there was only five. And you'll have a, a you'll be tracking who has, of all the apartments, who oh, has yeah. a, who has I'm used to towing not. cars for a number so of years. Someone so if someone did have this agreement and they came to you and they wanted to change their mind, you would go and look at your data and maybe there, yeah, if there you was know, the flexibility. there's enough spots that, right. So yeah. again, it's a communication thing. Exactly. David. I'd like to move again to approve um, the uh, site plan with the waiver of the parking requirements. I, I, th I would think, thank you, Chris, for draft, drafting up the findings and the, the conditions. I'm not quite sure. I believe, Janet, you may be proposing an additional condition about returning a year after the certificate of occupancy to report on how things are going. But I'm not quite sure if well, that's was, what you're doing. But but I'd like to, I, you know, we have other business to attend to here. We do have that included in the conditions. It was just how detailed it was going to get, which I think were her points. So if um, if the general consensus is the way it's, could you read it to us, Chris, the way it is right now? I took some notes uh, um, that you were going to add a condition about um, the applicant coming back in a year after the um, certificate of occupancy is issued to review the parking plan that's been um, put forth, um, to review the number of spaces that are being used, and to um, look at whether it's worthwhile to consider putting parking in those reserved parking spaces. I think there were six of them that were outlined on the plan. Um, so that's pretty much it. Thank you. Are there any other members who would like to add something to that? Jack? I'm, I'm just wondering about the timing. Is year adequate or should it be a year and a half or two years? Because, I mean, if he's open in spring, it will, you know, people don't get into the apartments. You know, the big changeover is August, isn't it? Uh, well, and I know I don't, I'm not sure a year. I think it makes sense to go through one turnover period. So we could 13. say 18 months or something. So 18 months. It would I be would, better would data, be. I think. If yeah, you went to 18 months. I'd be okay with 18 months, everyone. I see nods. Okay. So add that into the condition. Okay. Um, so back to David. Um, you were sort of saying that. We made a motion. Yes. So we're back on the motion, and are we ready to vote? Oh. Yeah, it was Maria a long time ago. That was before the findings and conditions. So. Or, yes. So um, I appreciate this, and I, I think that I appreciate the data. I, I think we're looking at one day. I've looked at. I've offered my other days when there was more parking. I think that um, the king isn't the data. The king is the bylaw and the requirement of the bylaw. And I don't think the conditions of the waiver have been met. That you've shown that there's not a need for parking, um, and it's almost a 50% cut in um, what would normally be there. And so I'm. I just want to say that I do think that this, the decision about parking was made through a process of the planning board approving the Bible law, sending it to the select board, sending it to town meeting. The language has meaning, and so I, I don't think we've met that waiver criteria. So, but I appreciate the effort, and I, I also hope that it works out. I just, I just don't think the tenant should have to bear that. So are we ready to vote at this time? Um, all in favor, affirmative, raise your hand. And we have five. Um, uh, no. Okay, one and one abstain. I, I think you still yeah. count as an abstain. <laughs> <Whatever>. <laughs> so five, one, one. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank Good you very luck. much for your patience and, and expertise and the time you people put into the board. I, I was on the Municipal Building Committee in Waitley, where I live, and I can very much appreciate it. We appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Now you have lots of hard work to do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. Thanks.
Okay, so we will move to, it's uh, 8, uh, 8.15, we'll move to SPP 2020-03, John and Jessica Brown, 389 Bay Road. get my uh, dog and pony all set up. I'm sorry, uh, I still have more to read. Oh, good. So, yeah, you know. that's great. Keep Okay, keep it preamble, you get organized. Public hearing, SPP 2020-03, John and Jessica Brown, 389 Bay Road. <coughs> In accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted. This hearing is being held for the purpose of providing an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPP 2020-03, John and Jessica Brown, 389 Bay Road. It is like 817, request for a special permit under section 7.722 of the zoning bylaw to allow a common driveway longer than 400 feet and an individual driveway longer than 1,200 feet as specified in section 7.713 of the zoning bylaw to allow a screen, a section of the driveway to exceed a 10% grade as required by section 7.715 of the zoning bylaw, map 26A, parcels 37R, O and RLD zoning district. First off, are there any board member disclosures? I see none. Uh, and we will move to the applicant's presentation. Uh, welcome, please introduce yourselves. Thank you, hi, my name is Bucky Sparkle. I am the design engineer for this project. And at my side, I have the applicant and owner of 389 Bay Road, uh, Jack Brown. Uh, and pardon me. Do I need to introduce myself, or that's no. <laughs> that's speak okay? He that's okay that he introduced myself. Oh, absolutely, okay. that's yeah. fine. And if you speak, make sure your oh, green sorry. lights on, sorry. and you have yes. to sort of like speak okay. close. Yeah, sometimes yeah. they turn off. The frequent flyers know what to do, so <laughs> yeah. Um, welcome. Uh, we did get um, lots of information in our packet, um, and you do have some. Um, Sorry, I've been talking too much already. Well, you I can have. alleviate that here. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So if you can just refer to uh, what we should be looking at, that's helpful. Sure. Um, I'm going to scroll down to one of the pages here to do my little introduction, and maybe I can make this a little bit. Eh, let see if I can get in a little better. Eh, that's not going to do it. All right. So... <clears throat> uh, as stated, we are, we are looking for some uh, permissions for the common and individual driveways for this property, and I'm going to go over the existing conditions first. Uh, presently, the, the property, um, there's an awful lot of land involved in this plan uh, just because it's, part of the, it's all part of the A&R process, but the 17-acre flag lot that currently exists is this purple line, basically everything that's not shaded and down here. So this is the property that we are considering. When it was uh, laid out, from a survey perspective, it was laid out with the intention of a, another flag lot being divided off of it. So it has a very wide uh, pole as part of the flag. Um, and <clears throat> that was done some years ago. Uh, the property is, is quite lengthy. It's about a half mile from Bay Road all the way to the back. So it's, it takes quite a bit of access. Uh, just the first part of the pole to here is just over a thousand feet. So uh, this is one reason that we're asking for permission to go a little longer because that's what we're working with. Uh, the property in the front is zoned RO, the outlying residential, uh, to about here, and everything to the to the left on the screen, which is south. All of this is uh, low density residential. Uh, there is technically an overlay because there is a. Uh, uh, intermittent stream that runs through here, so there's an FPC overlay that's just 25 feet wide or maybe off each side of the bank. Uh, that's about a football field away from everything that we're doing, so it's not really part of the project, but it does exist because um, we do have to mention that. Uh, currently, this site is primarily wooded. Uh, right here is Jack's home. Uh, it was his grandfather's home. His father lives right here. 
Uh, so this has been family land for quite some time. Uh, and um, he has so Jack's home and his yard is, this is the only section that is not wooded presently. There, as I mentioned, there's a, a stream, so that also means there's a wetland. This is also south of the area that we're working. We kept all the uh, disturbance north and out of the 100-foot buffer, so uh, we can not worry about dealing with the Conservation Commission and protect the resource area. The entire area is also being quite rural and backing up against uh, state lands and uh, the beautiful mountains back there. Uh, it is part of a priority habitat as listed by a Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program. So we know that there is, uh, we had them assess the site a little while ago and they say box turtle is out there. So we have prepared a turtle protection plan and submitted that as well. Uh, so there are some requirements uh, when, and we still have to continue to coordinate uh, both now and during construction. The, the Mass Wildlife says that it's fine as long as you do the certain protection. So we'll, we'll be doing those and bringing in a qualified biologist when it comes time for construction. Um, and I also want to mention that just the, the currently, uh, the combination of the common drive to here and the individual drive to Jack's house is uh, just over 1,900 feet long. Um, and that's meaningful because as we get into our proposal, uh, it's not a big difference from what's already there. So what we're hoping to do is add this slightly dashed purple line and create another A&R lot. So we're going to be out in front of the ZBA pretty soon uh, and set a home back here. So in order to access the, the property at this location, we're going to need to do a couple things here. Uh, first of them is to convert a portion of what is now an individual drive to a common drive legally. So the common drive now ends here, and then we would this, take this individual drive and uh, add it as part of the, the common drive agreement. There's an agreement for the property owners that make use of this, prop, uh, this road. So uh, we're going to turn this into common drive and then put a turnaround suitable for the fire department to get their largest apparatus to make a Y, a three-point turn there and then build an individual drive, that would be this blue dotted line, uh, through the path of least resistance through the woods, saving as many trees as possible, and then jumping onto an existing woods road, again, being conscientious of the trees, uh, to put a home site here uh, with the you know, septic system and well that would be necessary. Uh, in total, the new drive would be uh, just over 2,100 feet from beginning to end, so we're about 10% longer than is the existing condition, uh, even though we're going a good deal farther south. Um, <clears throat> and there is a section, um, so there's this area that's in yellow that's the converted common drive. And let me zoom in here a little bit. Let me get into more details. There we go. Hey, words you can read. Um, so the conversion of the individual drive to common drive is this sort of yellowish orange dashed area. But the section between the arrows, uh, which is 307 feet long, is an area that will be, uh, once we tweak the grading a little bit, it's going to be over 10%, but less than 15%. So that's another reason that we're here, is because we can do that only with your permission. Uh, presently, uh, there's about a 40-foot section that is uh, about 16% in steepness, so we're going to cut that back um, and sort of smooth the grade out. We've got plenty of room to do that. Uh, so then we're going to be under 15%. And actually, it's, it's 10 or 11% through most of this and 10, 11% through most of this. So there's just one little hump. And that uh, when uh, many members of the board were able to make the site visit earlier this week uh, during muddy conditions, so you kind of get to experience it. And it's, it's worst case scenario, more or less, uh, for this time of year. And it was it seemed manageable. Additionally, we do have uh, letters uh, a letter from the fire department indicating that they feel that the design is adequate for their apparatus. They can get the access that they need. We were already planning on doing a residential sprinkler system for the house, uh, which, when you get over a 150 foot long driveway, and you don't want to make it 20 feet wide, uh, that's uh, one of the options. Fortunately, there is an option. Uh, so the fire department seems to be on board with this from a safety standpoint. Um, so what I want to do is kind of do the formal request and, and you know, kind of wrap up my little presentation here. So uh, Section 7.7130 of the bylaw says that uh, a common drive 
can be more than 400 feet uh, with your permission. And we're looking to go from the common drive of 1,013 feet to uh, 1,420 feet, uh, which is the, the conversion of this, this yellow line here, about 400 feet. Um, Bylaws 7.731 says the combined individual and common drive normally would not exceed 1,200 feet. Uh, we're looking to go from 1,920 feet to 2,130 feet, so about a 10% addition over current conditions to basically then append this long driveway through here uh, to the very private building site. And uh, 7.715 of the bylaws says uh, a drive, uh, any drive over 10%, but less than 15 would require permission of the planning board. So a 307 foot section, that's this arrow region. Uh, we're looking to, to go, uh, the average is probably gonna be around 12% uh, for that run. Uh, and um, you know, I don't need to pair all the aspects of your bylaw back at you, um, but we do have comments. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll pare it down. Uh, 7.722 indicates that the planning board can ber give permission to make these adjustments, provided that we uh, follow the provisions of bylaws sections 6.330 to 6.335, uh, which I've always kind of enjoyed that section because it doesn't have a 6.334. I always feel like I'm, I have less homework when that's the case. Uh, so uh, these conditions, uh, and I and that we have. Um, I know Chris Restrup uh, provided uh, possible findings uh, relative to these that, that mirror the letter submittal that I um, made with the application. So uh, the first of these talks about uh, no adverse impact to the overlay district. The FPC is the only overlay district on site and it is um, not within the project limits so we have no impact on that. Uh, then we have uh, no undue safety hazard uh, and as, as Chris pointed out in the letter, the fire department's already taken a look at this. We're already making sure that the, the building has a 13D residential sprinkler system. Uh, we're providing a larger turnaround now, so actually uh, the fire apparatus only has a 55-foot diameter circle at the end of the common driveway, and what we're going to be is providing a much larger turnaround. It's a different shape. Um, I can actually scoot down a little bit. Um, so, whoop. I just did that, didn't I? Uh, to a, a detail, so here is um, a section. So this is the conversion of the individual drive to common drive. This is the new drive. And on the first plan, it just shows as a dashed line. But really, uh, it's 72 feet wide here. Uh, so the, the existing turnaround would end about here. And it's just a little circle like that. So that is not enough for the fire department. So what we're doing is actually increasing the safety for all the homes along this property by providing uh, a relatively consistent place where they can bring their giant apparatus. And they can't quite, quite do a quite circle, so they have to do a wide turnaround, but that's also permissible here. So they'll be able to back in and around from two different directions, actually three different directions, depending on how they decide the need to approach, because it also could be for the benefit of the existing home and not just uh, the proposed. Um, and then after, um, after the steep part of the drive, the new driveway, um, let me zoom out a little bit here. So this plan is, has a match line <clears throat> on this side to this side. So if you would come up the existing driveway and then turned into the new driveway, uh, it's very flat. So we've got uh, about 100 feet where it only changes a foot in grade. The steepest section here, we've got about a 40 foot run. That's about 6%, but normally the driveway is about 2 to 3%. So it's, it's very level. Uh, and if you were on site, once you get out of the woods, it's nice and flat up there. Um, another point um, in the bylaws 6.332 talks about um, environmental impacts. So we are aware that turtles may be present on site. We are making sure that the uh, silt fence barrier also is adequate as a turtle protection barrier. We will have posters out there letting the contractors know that the turtles might be around. We have a biologist who will be on site making inspections and making sure that uh, they have to do sweeps every day, look around the site. So the turtles are going to be uh, kind of the star of the show. If they're present, we don't actually know if we'll see a turtle or not, but we'll be ready for them. 
Uh, we'll have erosion controls in place. We know that there are wetlands um, in the area, and the erosion control also doubles as the turtle barrier. And because this is an application going out to the ZBA, uh, ZBA is always interested in, in what's going to happen with your stormwater, even, even for single-family residential projects where the state law says you don't have to worry about your stormwater for the first four homes at all. Um, the ZBA still likes to see you're going to do something. So we have dry wells added to the site in two locations. So the, all the roof water and a good deal of the water from the parking area by the house and uh, the first section of the driveway uh, is all going to be filtered and then sent back into the ground as infiltration. So uh, we're, we're not going to be sending very much water downstream at all. It'll be a gravel driveway as well. Um, 6.333 talks about uh, damaging natural features or views. Uh, the project is not visible from the public right away. There are no you know, significant natural features, lots of beautiful trees, uh, the vast majority of which are going to be staying and all the really good ones we make sure we're driving around. Uh, we're not taking out anything that's uh, super impressive. And uh, there aren't any particular views from the public way of this site. I think once if you happen to be the person living here, you might have a very nice view to the south. Uh, but that's a different issue than what we're talking about. And lastly, uh, the bylaw talks about you know, historic archaeological issues. And uh, there really aren't any in this area that we are aware of. Um, it's a bunch of woods right now. So. Uh, that's, that is my sh end of the spiel, so I'm happy to answer any questions or, um, and listen to public comment, should there be any tonight. Thank you. Um, at this point, we'll report on the site visit, which happened on Monday. Uh, does someone want to volunteer to report? I hear almost all of you were there. So <laughs> I know somebody's e Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Uh, there's very little to report beyond what uh, Mr. Sparkle just had told us. Uh, we tramped, tramped the woods and uh, followed the uh, line of the proposed driveway um, and found it to be, as, as it was described, uh, slight uh, elevation at a couple of points and uh, otherwise relatively flat area. Um, uh, and um, indeed, lots of trees. Uh, hopefully most of them can be spared, um, but even if they can't all be spared, there's still plenty to go around. Um, and uh, I think that's about the extent of, of the, uh, the needed site visit report. Thank you. Uh, do you have anything else to add, Chris? I just wanted to add that we did see the one place on the um, common driveway that is quite steep, that is um, uh, seven, what is Mr. Sparkle said it was 15.7%, and he's going to lower that to somewhere between 10% and 15%. So I wanted to just let you know that we saw that. Great. And were there any other questions or anything that were asked at the site visit that haven't been addressed? Okay, great. Um, at this time, I'll open up for questions to the board. Are there any questions to ask the applicant? Jack? This is not for the applicant, but I'm just wondering, for the ZBA and the common drive uh, limitation, why it seems like it's dis the bylaws are discouraging use of a common driveway for as max uh, for as long as length is is practical. Just wondering, why is there a limitation for a common driveway? Chris. Um, I think this bylaw was written a long time ago, and there are probably accommodations that we have now that people didn't have back then, such as the type of sprinkler system that can go in a residential building. So um, we're more equipped to be able to handle that type of situation than we were a long time ago, which may be why the length of driveway was limited. Um, Again, we have Mr. Mora here who may be able to explain that a little bit more, if you prefer to get an answer from He's him. He's good. <laughs> <laughs> Unless someone else wants more detail. No, we're good. Okay. Thank you. Um, Doug. Did I hear you right that this, is, this will be, would be served by water from a well? Yes, it's well and septic. That, it's part of town. Does that impact the the operation of the sprinkler system if you had a fire in the middle of a drought? 
Uh, not to my knowledge. It's my understanding that these things work just fine. And, uh, and the designer of the system, I'm, I'm not a fire sprinkler designer. That's a different type of an engineer. So I'm guessing a little bit here. But normally in water systems, there are reserve tanks. And if you're on a well, you, you will have a reserve tank to begin with. Uh, that's, that's how you can keep your water flowing uh, in a constant pressure because it's not the well itself that makes the water come out of your tap. There's another pump, right? So they're with a tank and a, and a bladder. Uh, so there is a certain amount of pressure on site uh, to begin with and, and reserve gallons. Is that tank like up in that top of the house or something? No, it's not like, you know, Manhattan buildings with those little, yeah. little towers up there. Uh, no, it's, it's a pressurized, it's, uh, it's a pump, it's a second pump is what, it was, what operates that. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. In Ireland, they put it up in the top of the house, too. That's oh. what I was wondering. In Ireland, they put it in the, uh, in the attic. Gravity is very well. reliable, I will say it, yeah, that. Yeah, it is. That's uh, why mm -hmm. they do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure that uh, the modern sprinkler systems would work so well just off of a gravity feed. I think they actually need higher pressure. Yeah, uh, so I think they're looking for that, um, the mechanical boost there. So too. Thanks. Um, any other hands, questions? Nope, I don't see any. Oh, oh, I see two. Maria first, oh, then Doug. Sorry, this has nothing to do with the site plan review. So the house isn't designed, but part of the requirements will be a sprinkler system for whoever is designing it and building or? Yes. Oh, okay. Interesting. Doug, go ahead. So I'm, I'm to, I guess until a few minutes ago, I had misinterpreted your property layout sheet two. I wondered if you could sure. go to that sheet yes. um, and tell me that, in fact, the house location is not. Sheet three, this sheet, is that? The house location is not that circle. No, no, no. So, um, that so circle... is the review of the property with the house location shown on it at this scale? On this sheet, no. What I'm going to do is I'll skip down one more. Um, if you want to see the whole the whole potential flag lot, almost all of it is, is here. Of course, there's the flag that goes all the way down to Bay Road. This I, does... Actually, what I'd rather see oh. is uh, go back to sheet two and okay. make it clearer for me where the house actually is. The house will be at the end of the driveway right here. So north of the 100-foot setback. Yes. And far, OK, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Any other questions? Actually, I have one Go more. This has aroused my, my latent interest in box turtles. Ah. Um, <laughs> it's been dormant. So. Yeah. Um, so, if, so is there an edge to the box turtle habitat? Like there's a 100-foot setback from a stream. In other words, are we damaging the box turtles by building a house on this lot at all? Is the box turtle not better to have your current house as the closest disturbance to its habitat? There, we don't actually know if there are turtle, turtles there or not. And the way, the way the Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program works is that basically they, they find an area that contains some amount of habitat that they're pretty sure has the species of concern. And then they will take you know, so you have you know, wetlands and waterways and ponds. Okay, these are big turtle areas, but they go through the woods too for mating, for foraging. So the, if you look at natural heritage maps, you will find that what they do is they take, all right, we think there are turtles here, and then they're gonna put a line around every single contiguously wooded parcel of land and say that entire area is a uh, red flag. Now, we're in that area, so that red flag required us to make a submittal and pay a fee and have Natural Heritage come out and take a look at the site and say, are there actually turtles here? And they said, there, there probably could be turtles here sometimes. And often this stuff is seasonal too, so uh, during mating season, you're gonna see turtles running around a lot more is my understanding. Other times of year, you're not gonna see them at all. Uh, so. It, they evaluate whether or not this project, because we have to tell them uh, the limits of disturbance and the nature of the project, is, is this going to be a problem? And they come back and they tell you if it will be a problem and to what degree it would be a problem. In some cases, they really put the brakes on. In this case, they say, well, 
you need to put up a turtle barrier so we don't run over them during construction. That was the limit uh, of what they felt was appropriate for this species in this habitat. That was a really yeah. good explanation. <laughs> I just have to say. <laughs> no, that was really good because it's very complicated and very vague and arid. That was good. Uh, any other questions, Doug? I was just going to add that, you know, I grew up here basically my whole life in this entire section and I've never seen a no. turtle in that, you know, in my life. So. <laughs> but in case. Yeah. Yeah. My home is also in a priority habitat as well. Um, there's a salamander. Never seen a salamander. But if you walk, ooh, you know, a thousand feet away, there's water. And, but my woods are contiguous with that. So, uh, Janet? So I have a question. Um, I'm just picturing, I, I know that your property is at the far end of the fire station. You know, like Amherst Woods isn't well covered by surf. And I do, I do wonder about um, ice and snow and fire trucks on that road. So what is the maintenance of that road during icy conditions or snowy conditions that keep it safe? Um, I mean, we sand and have it plowed. And, you know, it's, I don't, it's pretty gradual increase the whole way. So I don't think it's, it's never really been a problem for us. Mm -hmm. If there's uh, no more questions, I'm going to open it up to the public. Is there anyone here who would like to speak or ask a question about this project? I see no hands. So um, back to the board. Um, I could, uh, if there's no, does anyone have any concerns with this or could I move to the findings and conditions? Okay, good. Um, Chris, do I still, uh, Mr. Sparkle did such a great job going through all the findings. Do I have to read them again? So I, um, I wrote my findings before I reread Mr. Sparkle's letter. So what I propose is to put together, uh, I, I have some reference to his findings in these findings, but I propose to uh, sort of incorporate everything that he's written into this, if that would be and make, um, build them even better than yes, what you if that provided would us. Work out with you. Right? Is that agreeable to the board? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I will read the possible conditions for a special permit for the driveway at 389 Bay Road. Number one, final grading of the driveway and the turnaround area shall be subject to review by the fire department prior to the issuance of a building permit. Two, the design of the turnaround shall be approved by the fire department prior to the issuance of a building permit. Three, there shall be a 13 feet, six inch vertical clearance from the driveway surface to the overhanging tree branches to permit access by emergency vehicles. Four, no stone walls or major planting shall be installed at the mouth of the driveway as it exits onto Bay Road that would obstruct access by emergency vehicles. Five, the proposed house shall be constructed when an <clears throat> with an NFPA 13D sprinkler system. Uh, does the board um, have any other additional con uh, con uh, conditions that they would like to add? Michael? Question um, about the overhang of tree branches. Uh, presumably that has to be maintained uh, in some way. Um, should that be um, addressed in the conditions or should we just assume that's a ongoing part of the maintenance of the driveway. The, right, at all times a minimum of 13.6. Um, could add something about maintaining that clearance. Sure. To maintain a minimum of a 13.6, because I think the point is, if you cut it at 13.6, well, if it's yeah. June to, yeah. I, any others? And Chris, you haven't had anything else additional. This is the complete list. All right. So, um, yeah, please. So the Zoning Board of Appeals is going to have <clears throat> a chance to review this whole thing. <coughs> so don't worry if you don't catch absolutely everything. Okay. They can, they'll, and sorry, I don't want to ask you, Chris, while you're talking. So mm -hmm. in our packet, we do have um, a memo from the fire department and the town engineer. Uh, there's an a butter, a couple of butter letters, um, a 
common driveway memorandum. And that's just a standard thing that common, you're still. That's for the agreement to maintain. And then we have the turtle information. So I think we have everything. Um, is anyone feeling like a motion? Michael? I'll move we grant the uh, uh, approval special permit for this uh, um, driveway at uh, 389 Bay Road as proposed. And Thank close the public hearing. Sorry. Yeah, just sorry. And that, yes, Maria, I think you were about to. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any other further discussion, comments? Anyone want to make a statement? We're all good? Okay, so I think we can sure. take, yes, Doug. Uh, could, could you clarify what the zoning board needs to approve about this? And also, I'm interested to know, if this, since this is in a low density area, has that, is that defined anywhere? You know, one house per 17 acres, or one house per? It's much smaller. Three acres. Thank you. So the zoning requires um, for a single family house that's on a frontage lot, it requires 80,000 square feet, which is almost two acres. Yeah. And because this is a flag lot, it requires doubling that amount. So it requires four acres or 160,000 square feet. And I think there's um, well over that. I'm looking for the number. Uh, 7.4. Yeah, we're, we're over seven acres for the smaller parcel, and it's 3.67 acres required in the, as a flag lot in the low density. Mm -hmm. so. And zoning, yeah. Oh, keep going. So the other part of that question was, um, what else does the zoning board look at? And the zoning board is going to look at the placement of the house and the grading around the house and removal of trees and the width of the driveway and the construction of the driveway and all the things that are not grade of the driveway and length of the driveway. So they're pretty thorough in their review and they'll look at where the well is going to be and where the septic system is going to be and all of those things. Great. Yeah, they have a fine tooth comb. Mm -hmm. All right. Sounds like a site plan review. They're easier. <laughs> um, all right, so at this time, I think we're ready to take a vote. Uh, if I could see a show of hands for uh, an affirmative, yes, uh, no, and abstain. I'll abstain. Okay. Okay, great. So we have 601. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. So, we're going to move to item four zoning bylaw update and rewrite. Point A is Rob Mora, building commissioner for the town of Amherst. Presentation and recommendations on plan for updating and re, uh, rewriting the zoning bylaw. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Stick around. Well Good evening. Done. Thank you for your patience. Oh, thank you for having me. Rob Moore, Building Commissioner. Uh, so here tonight to talk about uh, the possibility of uh, a comprehensive review and uh, rewrite and redesign of the zoning bylaw. Uh, some of you have heard this uh, part of this already, uh, but we, uh, I thought it was interesting that a uh, little bit of the history that over the past 10 years, we've uh, proposed 93 uh, amendments. Uh, most of those went to town meeting except for the last one and uh, 60 of those amendments uh, were adopted over the, that, that time frame. Uh, <clears throat> what we're talking about here about is uh, uh, doing this now and, and why it's a good reason to do it now. Uh, we have uh, no indication that development is slowing down. 
Uh, we certainly have many reasons and examples why the bylaw could be improved. Uh, there's a lot of uh, good technical uh, work going on, technical studies, uh, upcoming master plan update that we can align with, and some other opportunities here that are worth uh, pursuing. Uh, so thinking about getting started, uh, reviewing the bylaw page by page, section by section, by section. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, overview uh, and, an, and outlining an approach, working with the zoning subcommittee and the planning board. Uh, just important to know that uh, everything that we're discussing tonight uh, in, in, in its possibility would always go, uh, whether it's staff or wherever uh, consultant level uh, activity that was occurring in this review, uh, would always be funneled through the zoning subcommittee, uh, ultimately back here to the planning board. Uh, we would be looking at uh, how we assign staff tasks in this uh, big project and uh, having uh, working with the zoning subcommittee on updating the uh, priorities. That's the, um, the sheet that you're probably familiar with that has uh, been worked on over the past uh, several years. Uh, so this page by page review, uh, I want to talk a little bit about that, this in a little bit more detail than we did last night. Um, for those of you that were at the zoning subcommittee meeting. Uh, and I thought I'd go uh, through each of the articles really quickly and just talk about things. Uh, this is not a comprehensive list. Uh, it doesn't include everything that we possibly would be addressing. Uh, these are not things we want to discuss in detail tonight, but just to give you uh, maybe for, for your benefit the scope of this project as I see it at this point. Uh, some, some sections will require quite a bit of work and some not so much. Uh, starting off with Article 1, our purpose, uh, this is a pretty easy section to work on. Uh, there certainly are um, areas to expand that and articulate what we want to accomplish and have the bylaw uh, uh, goals be and objectives. Um, moving on to Article 2, districts, uh, there's uh, uh, some boundary interpretations that could be improved. There's a uh, possibility of looking at some of the districts, the commercial district being one of them and understanding its purpose and making sure that the standards and criteria do align with that purpose. Um, I'm wondering if there's a need for the, the flood uh, prone conservancy district moving forward long term after the new flood maps are adopted. Uh, and then, you know, there's always possibility of some zoning adju uh, map adjustments as an outcome of that review. Uh, Article 3, uses. Now, this is one that, that really, in my opinion, needs a, uh, a pretty major overhaul. Uh, the tables could be improved. Uh, there's a possibility of a proposal to redesign by districts. Uh, this would uh, add criteria and standards, uh, possibly reduce uh, the need for special permits for certain types of uses. Uh, bring clarity to the, the role of the land use boards. Um, as we just listened a few minutes ago, you know, that, that was a case where that applicant has to go to both boards uh, in order to accomplish what they need to for a residential development. So there's still areas of the bylaw that could be improved. Uh, updating the design review board's uh, procedures, uh, looking at the educational district. Uh, I've uh, been pointing out that the educational district does not have any dimensional standards that go along with it. Uh, not really much of an issue as long as everything that happens continues to happen the way it has on those uh, in, for the institution and the colleges. But when you look at the possibility of land being conveyed to a private developer, we need to be prepared for that. Uh, mixed use standards, apartments and townhouses are some of the, the, the bigger items to look at and, and, and there's more. Uh, moving on to Article 4, the development methods. We, we actually don't see a lot of activity uh, in this section uh, as far as projects coming forward at the moment anyway. Uh, I would suggest that we review it for conflicts and inconsistencies, uh, possibly some minor updates uh, and improved graphics. Um, oh, back to uses, of, I had a couple of uh, points to make here is that when we're looking at it, Article 3, um, you know, and possibly designing the bylaw to be formatted with the um, districts dictating how you um, set your criteria, uh, there's often the possibility of being repetitive in that information. And if you, if you start looking at other examples, you'll see where that occurs with parking requirements, tables, uh, and, and it adds, it adds pages to your bylaw. But I think that's okay because ultimately what we want to have is that easy to read and understand bylaw that we don't have necessarily today. 
um, accessory uses. This is a section of the bylaw that's been uh, much improved in recent years, uh, but it still needs a little bit of updating. Uh, we, could, we could see some additions and updates uh, regarding supplemental apartments, although the, over, the overall section of the bylaw works very well. Uh, outdoor dining and accessory uses on farms. Uh, dimensional requirements. Uh, graphics would be uh, a, a great help, improving those and adding some perhaps. There's interpretation issues. For example, coverage. This is one that comes up all the time, uh, particularly with split districts. How do you calculate the coverage from one district to another? Um, and also in building coverage and structure coverage, what counts and doesn't count, such as solar panels themselves. Do they mm -hmm. count in coverage? Uh, these are things that are not clearly answered by the bylaw, but we've had to take uh, a position on it. Uh, flag lot criteria, uh, you didn't get to get into that on that last case, but the zoning board will. Uh, and, and that could be uh, some standards and criteria could be improved in, in that section of the bylaw. Table three, uh, footnotes is always, a footnote A is always one that uh, generates a lot of discussion. Uh, is there a need for it? Is it uh, accomplishing what we want uh, to accomplish with it? Uh, should we consider downzoning in certain areas with uh, possible bonuses for maybe affordable housing or sustainable building? All things that we're just thinking about um, and, and these are the types of uh, items that we would be bringing forward for discussion as we got into this uh, project. Uh, seven, parking uh, needs a lot of work. Um, I think everyone's aware of that, the general requirements, the municipal district, and then common drive and access criteria, mainly to align with fire safety uh, requirements and state law. Uh, signs, again, uh, complete overhaul, uh, non-conforming uses, uh, it, it's uh, pretty um, uh, pretty good section of the bylaw. There's a couple of areas where we can improve uh, the language to have better ability to interpret the language. Uh, and then they're also updated with some recent case law that uh, changes some things uh, from, from the older language. Article 10 is our uh, special permit granting authority uh, section. Really just needs some minimal updates. Uh, maybe modernize the language through the 10.38 findings that are used um, every day in the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, process. Article 11, you might have some ideas here. This is the, the section of the bylaw that uh, kind of uh, talks about planning board voting requirements, landscape standards. Uh, I'm sure it could use some minimal updates. Uh, and then uh, definitions, uh, we could use improved meanings and uh, adding quite a bit uh, to the uh, to the pages of our additions uh, definitions. Uh, so how are we going to do this? Uh, you know, there's uh, quite a bit of work that could be handled by staff uh, and and working day to day to to get this started. Uh, the formatting that's needed to redesign the bylaw, starting to build the framework for all the the various sections to be uh, updated as needed. Uh, the amendments that have been worked on in the past by the zoning subcommittee uh, continue to be worked on and, and future uh, subcommittee work uh, would go on. And then there's, there's definitely going to be the need for an outside consultant. Now, we, don't, we, we won't have the ability to bring in a, a consultant in to do everything we'd like to do, uh, particularly at once, uh, but we certainly can get started and, and have the planning board decide what those priorities are and, and work on uh, bringing in that uh, professional uh, assistance. Uh, staff work, uh, I talked about this a little bit. Uh, we can identify the inconsistencies and conflicts, look at uh, improving graphics, standards and criteria that were missing or, or could be clarified, uh, work on definitions and uh, other areas. Zoning subcommittee has a long list of things that they uh, have always been working on, will continue to work on, and possibly some of those items could uh, become big enough that uh, we would look to have a consultant help in some areas. Uh, we're quite certain the consultant would be, uh, we'd be interested in having a consultant for things like parking, downtown, uh, signage, uh, and so on. Uh, this is just a, a very brief outline. We don't have to go through it right now, but it's in your packet for uh, the process that uh, has to occur in order to change the bylaw. It's a little different than it was in the past uh, dealing with the uh, select board. Uh, so 
uh, that brings me to the end. Uh, where, where do we want to go next? I'm hoping for uh, the planning board to consider that this is a, uh, a, a good thing that uh, will uh, be a major improvement to the town regulations. It's not going to be easy. Uh, and uh, I want to make, um, just stress the point that this doesn't, if we did move forward with this, this doesn't stop anything else from occurring that's either in process or the Planning Board or Zoning Subcommittee uh, feels is uh, necessary to occur this year, more immediate than what this pro when this project would be completed. And uh, staff is ready to uh, start uh, working on this and setting goals and, and working with the Zoning Subcommittee to uh, bring this project forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, will you take questions? Absolutely. Now? Does the board have any questions? Doug? Do you have a timeline in mind? Not at this point, but it's more than a year for sure. Uh, I think as we get into the uh, really doing that page by page review, talking with the zoning subcommittee, laying out our priorities and, and understanding what we want to accomplish specifically by doing this, how deep we're going to go, then I think we could start to think about the timeline that would, would be necessary. Janet? So um, other cities that have done this, do you have a sense of how long it took them? I mean, I know Somerville was nine years and Northampton had a, is planning four years just to deal with their downtown and they've already done an overhaul. Does anyone know how long that took? I'm not sure how long Northampton took, but I've seen anything from one year to seven or eight years, as you've suggested. Uh, any other questions? Um, Jack and then Doug. Um, so <clears throat> how is the, the zoning map? And, you know, it, it goes kind of hand in hand with the bylaw. Um, how are changes made to the zoning map? I, I'm, again, I'm not part of the zoning subcommittee. I shouldn't probably know this, but. Um, How would they occur? The, the, yeah, the process. I mean. It, it's, I, the, it's the same process that it would, you know, that, that would occur for adopting a new bylaw. So the, 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 would the zoning uh, map be reviewed concurrently? Yes, I think, okay. I think as we get into certain sections of the bylaw, the districting, the boundary interpretations, it'll, uh, the standards and criteria in some of the districts, it'll, it'll force us to look at the map along with that and determine whether or not there's any adjustments needed. Yeah, because I just want to state, as everybody knows, the BL district is unworkable, and there was a, 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 an amendment presented to the town meeting back by uh, Jerry Gadera, you know, just kind of reinforcing that it, they're, they're not billable lots basically based with the current zoning bylaw restrictions that they have so that's a big chunk obviously to sure to handle yeah. would that get broken down some ways like you just focus you know you you did it article but which was section by section but like downtown or um, villages or I think so I think that would be part of the priority setting that would occur with the zoning subcommittee and the planning board um, I think that what um, is being talked about there is the transition zones that I had noted up there. You know, that might be something where the BL, um, you know, consultant for the BL could be useful uh, in helping there, but it's also part of downtown or adjacent to downtown, so it could fall into a couple of different areas of review. And um, we're doing the master plan update section by section and sort of reviewing it section by section and it, it sort of goes out to the public section by section and we're going to have um, like a website where the different drafts mm -hmm. and sections are there for people to come and also they can comment on it. Um, do you expect it'll be something like that with the zoning bylaw that you'd release it and how do you see public um, forums or any yeah, part to that? Yeah, I, I do. Um, definitely there'll be a web presence uh, of the work and reporting on what's going on. Um, most of the activity will occur um, between staff and zoning subcommittee, I'm imagining. Um, and it, there'll be decisions made when something needs to come to the planning board for a presentation uh, beyond the zoning subcommittee's normal report to the planning board. 
and then I, there'll be another decision to be made, when do we go to the CRC so that they can be properly updated, uh, so that they can update the council. And then I would also, for certain, you know, some of these uh, topics would probably benefit from district meetings uh, yeah. throughout the town. You know, as we get, as we get into them, we'll be able to identify where that makes sense, uh, but I would expect there to be uh, some. And then, then when we bring in a consultant, the public forum and typical process that we would use uh, follow with a consultant uh, would likely occur. It's good to hear. Thank you. Any other, Michael? Um, I'm interested in the question of why uh, the so there seems to be a lot of emphasis on the uh, the sign bylaw, the sign section. Um, I can understand uh, the emphasis on all those other areas that you, you're highlighting. And uh, I'm, I'm a little bit of a loss to understand why the signage bylaw seems to be so important, uh, important enough to seem to th need to have a th consultant thrown at it. Um, why is that such an issue right now? Well, the, the sign regulations are very troubling for us day to day. Uh, so there's a little bit, there's a lot in the zoning bylaw, there's a little bit in the general bylaw. Uh, for temporary, uh, the A-frame uh, style signs that you see around. And it's very restrictive. Both of those are very restrictive. We actually enforce the bylaw as it's written, zoning and general bylaws. A lot of the signs would disappear. Uh, there's annual permitting requirements for a lot of these signs that have never, it's never, a program's never been established for that. So years ago, um, when we identified this as an issue, you know, we kind of, we, we went around and talked to the bid chamber, area businesses, um, the select board, and we talked about, well, let's do, we want, we don't want to ignore it entirely. We know it needs to be worked on, but we're going to deal with certain things. You know, the, the signs that are stuck in the ground at the intersections and, and, and all over the place. Um, when the store facades are, are, are covered too much with signs. Uh, and we decided to kind of frame what, we would pay attention to at the moment while we're waiting for the sign bylaw to get looked at. Our sign regulations are not consistent with uh, some federal case law that's occurred uh, having to do with displaying uh, the messages uh, and having to read the content in order to decide whether or not enforcement action is necessary. So we need to align there to make sure that we're legally sound with our bylaw. Uh, we've gotten some guidance on this. We've had our bylaw look at, looked at so we know it needs to be addressed. And then it gets down to what do we want it to accomplish and, you know, does it do that? And, and I think we'll have a whole wide range of opinions on that. Uh, and I've been through a uh, sign, major sign enforcement and rewrite uh, during my time as a building official. And it's a very uh, sensitive matter. Uh, it brings a lot of emotions from business owners and, and, and the people of the community, so we want to make sure we do that right. Uh, and that's why we're suggesting that we probably need a consultant to help guide through that, somebody that is experienced with signage, uh, and, and help us with that. I was doing some research on different municipalities who are trying to do recodifications or rewrite their bylaws, and I have to say I noticed many of them are their bumps are the same kind of bump in the roads that we have, and many had either bids going out for consultants for the sign bylaws, mm -hmm. or they were bringing stuff to their town meeting. Or so, and it's it's always a standalone issue. So that yeah. always tells me that it's fairly complicated. Yeah. Good luck, <laughs> <laughs> um, Janet. So I, it, this sounds like a massive undertaking, and I like the idea of it not being that way. But it, it seems to me that. Um, we could take it at different levels, but it seems like we're looking at form-based zoning, redrawing, you know, district boundaries, um, or rezoning the map, which is needed. You know, we need to do something with the village centers. I didn't know the sign was such a big thing, but you know, and so I'm interested in, um, and then consultants and Christine Brestrup last night, yesterday had talked about how you got $50,000 to start this process a bunch of years ago, but didn't get it the next year, and so I'm concerned about um, how long this will take, the staffing needs, the cost of it in terms of consultants, and is there, um, will that money be there? Like why start a process and is you know the town manager on board that this could be a five or six year process with consultants year after year? Um, so what's the, what's the budget for it? And then 
I'm really worried about the staffing in the planning department because I know how you guys are, are flat out. And so would that be a staff person or one or one and a half people? You know, what's, you know, what, what will that look like over how many years? Um, and then I'm really interested in making sure the public is involved from the beginning and knows where we're, what we're starting and what the goal is and then how, we're, how they can participate. And so that, those are my major ones. And again, I would love to know how other towns and cities did this very successfully because I, I would like to learn from their experience of the bumps in the road and I'd like to skip those. Sure. Um, all great questions. Some of those aren't answered yet and they will as we get into the process. Um, as far as the funding goes, as Ms. Brestrup mentioned, there's some um, prior capital money that's available for this purpose. Uh, I haven't had any indication from the town manager that this is not a good project to move forward, and we do have some money requested in this year's capital uh, plan, and I'm sure we will, I think it's another $60,000, Ms. Brestrup. So we have $40,000 from a few years ago that was designated for downtown planning and zoning, and I've asked for another $60,000 for FY21. So if you combine those amounts, we would have $100,000 to go ahead with this um, project. So I'm hoping that's a good start, uh, and, and not at this point anticipating a five or six year, or looking forward to a five or six year project. Uh, but we'll know more, I think, once we do get into it and we decide as a group what do we want, how deep, how far do we want to go, what do we want to accomplish with this. You can see from those slides through the articles, some, you know, half of, the, half of the sections of the bylaw need very little work uh, and can easily be accomplished. Others are going to take quite a bit of time. Doug? Yeah, I was just, I was mostly interested in hearing from Chris. Um, I don't know what staff you had in mind to work on this, but if Chris is part of that plan, you know, you're going to be writing our master plan. Uh, and do you have time for this? <laughs> or, you know, how does this work for you? Um, I think, you know, we're, we've been asked to do this, and this is something that we are committed to doing, and we will make it work. And um, fortunately, Rob is going to head up the zoning portion of this, which is probably a lot more complicated than the master plan portion. I'm heading up the master plan portion. Um, I've already gotten a pretty good start on that, and um, I think I know what, what I need to do there. So little by little, we'll get through it. Initially, we had hoped to accomplish all of this in the year 2020, but I think as we're getting into it and you know becoming more realistic about things, we're realizing it's going to take longer than that. But the other thing is that we we're lucky enough to um, add, I shouldn't say add, I should say replace, replace someone who left last June. So we've essentially been down a whole person in the planning department for the last you know, eight months. Um, now we're going to be replacing that person. He'll start full time in June, and that will be a big boost to our department to give us you know, a good foundation to move forward with projects. And, um, so maybe we'll have to be a little judicious about adding other projects like we tend to do, but we'll work on this together and I'm sure we'll make it work. Janet. So Mr. Moore, will you be working on this full time, half time? Like what what time? I'm just I'm just I mean, it seems like a really large project in staff time and budget and length. Mm -hmm. And um like I'd like to know what we're doing and agree, deciding to do before we just embark on it. So we'll be working on it regularly and continuously. Do you think uh, it'll be like half time for you, or I don't think it'll be half time for me. I don't think it could be half time for me. Uh, but we also, as Ms. Brestrup mentioned, we have some very talented planners on staff and other support staff that would be able to assist with this. Some of this work will rely on our IT department to help us get started with. Um, just how the basic formatting of the bylaw. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a lot of people involved, and um, I think, I think as a team, it's something that we could accomplish. I do believe you've worked on the recodification and reworked bylaws in some other town a couple in your past. Well, I have. I have. I've, I've been through it twice. Uh, in in one uh, example, there was uh, a, a large zoning subcommittee. Uh, that did a lot of the work, and another was the town attorney that did a lot of the work with staff. 
Uh, so it was two very different types of um, rewrites as, as far as process goes. So different uh, but players all, for all, different areas. Right, but both ended with a um, repeal and replace of the bylaw. Nice. Jack? Um, I don't <clears throat> mean to be funny, but uh, has the town considered uh, uh, interns for this from the many universities and colleges that we have in the area? <laughs> I think this is going to require a certain amount of expertise, and um, you know, Rob and I know the bylaw really well. We know its ins and outs and how it all relates to different parts of it. And so, I think an intern would be completely baffled by this project and not really very useful. I'm sorry to say, but maybe we could use interns to do other things to free our time up to do this. So, is it possible that um, you know? I know Amherst is unique and special, and it's all, you know, but you could go look at other people who have recently done recodification of bylaw, and there must be guidelines, and you could sort of start with that and use it as a boilerplate and then tailor it to Amherst. So all of this isn't like have to be created, right? And yeah, I don't think it is. Um, and we are starting with our document and, and working that the direction we want it to go. But I think as we get into every, each section or each topic, we do look for examples, and yeah. we, we talk to our colleagues in other communities and, and get ideas and learn what worked and didn't work. And I don't think we're there yet to do that, but I think we will absolutely uh, be in that position as we're going through this um, many times through the process. And that was one of the beauty that's good about consultants. They usually have the best practices, and they've worked with lots of municipalities, so they can point you right to where. Um, right. That might be a good example. So. Right. Hmm. Maria. Uh, I just want to reiterate what we've been talking about at previous meetings where um, I'm really excited about this because we've been sort of using this priorities chart and rearranging it and I think <clears throat> working with the staff who really have the expertise about what our problem area is, what's coming up in the pipeline, things we should be focusing on so that as a team effort, like you're saying, we can figure out how to prioritize the bigger, more complicated things as far as where to put money and the consultants mm. and where to put like the smaller things that maybe the zoning subcommittee can take on in small bites. So I'm really excited about just trying to prioritize our millions of issues that we have going on with this town. So um, I think, yeah, just diving right in and sort of seeing what we're up against um, is probably the best way rather than talking about the process and how long it's going to take. Let's just give it a go. And, um, and yeah, we will come across roadblocks and, you know, difficult areas, but that's, we've already, we know that's going to happen. So, so um, yeah, I think I, I really appreciate your proactive sort of, you know, just let's do this kind of, because we've, yeah, we've spent hours deliberating on things that are just flaws in our bylaw, and so it'd be great to just finally get it where we are hoping to get it, so. So true, so true. Mm -hmm. I know you don't have a timeline, but, and things go through the zoning subcommittee before they come to planning board. When do you anticipate the zoning subcommittee would start seeing things come out of your department? Uh, I'm ready to get started on this. So, uh, you know, it, you know unless, unless the planning board said you're crazy, don't do this, uh, you know, we're ready to start, you know, looking at our, um, our, our availability immediately to start figuring this stuff out um, and working with the, the zoning subcommittee and uh, look forward to uh, attending more of those meetings and, okay. Great. and getting going on this. That, uh, Michael? Yeah, um, I presume if we're talking about a zoning, a new, a brand new zoning bylaw essentially, which has to be approved by the, by the council, that there will be requirements for public hearings, the official public hearings. At what point in the process of your writing it, of the zoning subcommittee reviewing it, the planning board reviewing it, the CRC reviewing it, and going to town council, at what point in that path are public hearings appropriate? Are, are, are there going to have to be lots of them for, for, on the same question? Or can they be arranged so that um, they, they happen when there's something really specific to talk about as opposed to general ideas? How do you think this is going to go? Um, public hearings, meaning the actual public hearing when we're getting ready to adopt a, a bylaw, is a process that the CRC is working with the planning board on right now. So I think we're still trying to, you know, 
finalize what that process will look at look like with joint public hearings uh, before something ultimately gets to the council. Uh, along the way, there's going to be um, as many public discussions about this as necessary. And I'm going to rely, I think, you know, as I bring things to the zoning subcommittee and they're working on their own things, um, you know, when is it appropriate to come to the planning board? You know, we have uh, a very good communication uh, channel with the uh, staff support to the CRC. You know, we'll be able to keep the CRC updated about the work that's occurring and understand when it's the right time to bring things forward. And then we'll just know when there's uh, a, a topic or a subject that we need to get out there and, and work harder at getting public input on. So I, I think it's going it, to, it's hard to map that out right now and give you, give you a, a, a clearer answer on that, except that it's going to occur quite a bit uh, and as much as needed. Uh, ultimately, we need, this is a planning board uh, proposal. This is, this is going to be sponsored by the planning board, and we need to make sure that we, uh, when we get to the end, we have the support that we need. Doug? So I'm, I'm imagining that your uh, interest in this is because you work with the zoning bylaw every day and you have to make calls on gray areas or fill in gaps on emissions or it, that your interest is predominantly about working day to day with the existing document that we have that is just outdated. So. I guess my question maybe for the board or for Chris and even for you, Mr. Mora, is we have some expression of a vision for where the town is going through the master plan. But there's a whole lot of potential interpretations about what that master plan said says and will say once Chris rewrites it and how that gets expressed as a, as a zoning. You know, do we want to have five-story buildings all the way through downtown? I mean, or do we want to extend downtown all the way to UMass? I mean, those are pretty big questions and I'm assuming we need to have some sort of vision from the board that gets tempered by public hearings and feedback from you guys so that we're not just sort of tinkering with the, we're not tinkering under the engine, we're buying a new car. I mean, I mean I'm not sure what metaphor to use, but you know, if, where, do you, where do you think we are on that since, since you brought up the subject? <laughs> Um, well, I think we're going to have those discussions starting pretty soon and, and setting that priority. And, and for, you know, just your specific to your example there, you know, downtown is one of the areas where we're hoping to bring a consultant in and help us figure that out. You know, does the boundary work? Do the number of stories work? Did the density work? And those are, that's absolutely going to be part of this process if you want it to be. If you tell us that that's a priority, then we will write an RFP and, and work to engage a consultant to start that process. So, so this is, um, you're bringing this proposal to us and then, you know, this is the presentation of your ideas of how this should go and then someone has asked you to do this, which I'm assuming, I don't, I've been trying to figure this out for months and so, the question that you're asking about what's the board's vision for this process and how we want to design it and what our goals are, um, part of it could be just to be implementing the master plan because it does call for a lot of changes in zoning. But I think that um, I really, you know, I think your questions, what's the goal, what's the vision, is really important for the planning board to discuss. And then for me, it's what's the process, what are the resources needed, and important to involve the public because we're terrible at that. I mean, nobody comes to our hearings basically and the master plan process had an excellent public participation, so I'd like to see that put to, something like that put together for such a large undertaking. But I, I can't even know how I would describe it at this point, or what our focus is, or why we're, why this proposal you're suggesting is our proposal, and what we think about it, you know, where we should go, what are the priorities, um, the vision thing, I think, which is I think what you were talking about, Doug. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Yeah, I mean. 
I mean, we've, I've already noticed there's no definition of mixed-use building in the zoning, you know. So if you stick one office on the end of a residential building, it's a mixed-use building. So I've, in a month, seen a few problems. But, and you guys know all of the rest of them, I'm sure. But I'm less interested in, um, I'm really thinking, is there, who, how does the process happen, or how does the vision get hammered out? And is it really, does it include the consultant and the staff? And when, where does it originate? You know, you can hire a consultant to come in and help us conduct a process whereby we develop our vision. And that's one expense. <laughs> um, or you can, if you have a vision and you say to the consultant, come and write a code that realizes this vision, that's a much cheaper process. I guess we'll see where it goes. We need to, we need to yeah. get started and, and get to that discussion, and we're just not there okay. yet. But I assume no matter how fast this process goes, we can't give it to the town council until we've given them the master plan. Because they don't want to see zoning changes from us until the master plan is done. They would prefer that. that the master plan effort be done before this effort, but it sounds like it, it would be by a fairly big distance of time. We'll be done with the master plan within a year, and then this would take over a year, so probably a couple of years. We can make sure that that happens that way. We can just delay the zoning until the master plan's done. Chris. I don't think that means that no zoning bylaws will be going till till the recode of whatever the rewrite is done. I mean, other things will probably come through the pike uh, while yeah, you're I, working I think, on I it. I think zoning bylaw amendments could go now if there was something that needed to go. Part of what, why they haven't and not is the next thing on our agenda is coming up for the first time, developing the process that bylaws actually get changed because it hasn't happened since we changed from a town meeting to a town council and with that it totally changed the system so um, that is actually the next item on our agenda um, but before we move to that I just for us are you you know you're are you coming to us and looking for our support to start this initiative um, are there other groups you have to go talk to do you want a, a recommendation from us or support uh, I think it really is trying to understand the board's support to get started on this uh, because it, it would be going through the process as a sponsored amendment or bylaw by the planning board. Um, well, it's sort of what Maria was saying earlier, I'm really excited to get going on this and I feel like we've been waiting a really long time and I know all the criteria and scope of work isn't exactly delineated right now, but we know good work needs to be done, whether it's the recodification, which is more a little more simple, or touching some of those more substantial issues that might trigger a consultant and usually trigger some controversy, so there's more need for public outreach. Um, but you got to get started somewhere, and I think you're very confident and know exactly where to begin for the first step. Um, Jack? So, for clarification, the master plan is, is not a rewrite, it's an update. Sure. <clears throat> yep. Which I feel like are pretty straightforward changes. And now with the bylaw, it is a rewrite. This is an aggressive overhaul and will take place <clears throat> subsequent to the master plan update. Is that the right? Yes. Yes. Correct. Okay. It'll take a while to do this. <clears throat> and Michael? Um, I'm, I'm troubled by um, what the public process might be. Um, in regard to what Doug mentioned ago, a minute ago about what the vision is or should be or what, how it might get developed, um, a couple of years ago we had a series of um, sessions involving the public, uh, trying to imagine what downtown would be like, should be like. Um, 
there were, I think, four, weren't there, Chris? Four, just two? Okay, well, there were, two, there were two sessions, and they were well attended by a large number of people, and lots of uh, proposals, um, were, or lots of ideas were suggested. Um, and um, as, as far as I know, nothing really ever came of that. Um, am I correct in that? Chris, yes, you can answer that. Uh, you are correct that nothing ever came of it, but that doesn't mean that that information isn't still with us. We still have all of that information in our office. I think we got a little bit distracted by the change of government, and I think the last time we met for downtown was probably in December of 2017. Then we had the vote to change our form of government in March of 2018. Then we went through you know, a whole year of changing our government. So. We've been in a little bit of a turmoil. So I think now that we've got our new government in place, um, we can retrieve some of that information that we were so happy and lucky to get before from the public about what they wanted to see in the downtown and start to incorporate some of that in some of the changes that we're gonna make. I would like to see changes to the downtown zoning. I'm troubled by the setback of some of the buildings. I'm troubled by um, setback and, and height together for some of the buildings and the lack of sidewalk room and various things that I think other people are troubled by and I think we really need to look at those things. Um, we're going to be experiencing more and more development as time goes on. We're aware of some parcels that are being looked at and so I think we really need to get going on this. Otherwise we're gonna just keep spinning our wheels and I think we've been kind of in that mode for a while now. And this gives us a chance to get going and, and start doing some things. So definitely we will bring back some of that um, input that we've received from those two forums, which I agree were very good, and incorporate some of those ideas. Uh, I, yeah, I was, I, I was gonna say that um, I appreciated those uh, forums, um, but I felt that the uh, overall, cons the overall collection of opinions lacked a consensus on what, what the vision for downtown would be, uh, particularly on the questions of what the boundaries of it might be. Um, and it leads me to wonder exactly how to structure a series or a public meeting or a series of public meetings, sessions, whatever we want to call them, where uh, not only can individual views be aired, but where you and the board and the zoning subcommittee can take the, the information and proceed on it with some reasonable assurance that it represents the view of the town as a whole. Uh, and that's what I'm, I'm concerned about because uh, there are many people in town who are very vocal about what they think the town should be. There are many other people who have very strong opinions and, and are not vocal. They prefer to exercise their influence in other ways. Uh, and I, uh, I have a hard time figuring out how those two constituencies, which are certainly not in full agreement with each other and maybe in total disagreement with each other, I'm not sure, somewhere in between those two mm -hmm. places, how that could get resolved in a way that would lead to a successful vision of what the town would be like, which would then result in a successful rewrite of the zoning bylaw. Uh, and I'd love to hear from other members of the, of the board and from you uh, what, how that might better work than it has worked in the past. I'll say one thing that I think it will be impossible to get everybody on the same vision or the same hope or the same look. But what I do realize is what's happening right now is things can be built and things are being built. And we could all have different opinions on this board on whether those buildings are likable or not likable or attractive or not attractive. But the truth is they're being built and they're gonna to continue to be built. But I bet there are things that we all agree on that we know need to be improved and could be improved. And Chris mentioned a few of them a few minutes ago. Um, I think everybody, I mean, what's not to buy in with wider sidewalks or 
not just a flat front on a building and maybe have a little bit something to soften it or you know different heights I mean even the look of a building can change the height they could all be five-story buildings but all have like a different feel when you're walking down the street so my point is I think we can all I hope find a common ground that it's we may not find a perfect vision for everybody to buy into but can we improve what we're doing right now and I think we can and by twi fixing some of these bylaws even if we don't I think you know Mr. Moore has a huge job ahead of them and the truth is though in two or three years or when this gets passed it may not be all done or all perfect and there will still be parts that have to be worked on um, but you know hopefully areas will be identified and broken off for consultant help um, and that you will do a huge load in improving it so right now it's hard to get in the weeds and trying to find a common vision but I'm just hoping we can all get on board here and say yes you know what our bylaw could really use some improving and let's get doing it because I feel like we've been waiting for years and anyways I I, I think I saw Doug earlier and then um, Janet, and anyone else want to speak? I, and Jack, okay. I was just going to offer a motion of <laughs> that the board vote to, in support of Rob's proposal and maybe as a way of going on record and moving on to other parts of the agenda. I would love that. Consider it so moved. So, and is there a second? Okay, is there any more discussion? I know other people had their hands up that you know we could vote to support this effort and to start moving forward. I just have a question. Uh, do we have a, I, I believe we do, a historical account of the development of the bylaw over the years? <laughs> just for oh, reference boy. and you know, because <laughs> I feel like it's a very old you document. No, I just feel like okay. it's an old document. It'd be nice to know where we were and where we're going to arrive, you know. I could put forth a summary. I'm mean, not right now, but I could <laughs> write up a summary of how we got where we are. And a, a lot of it has to, well, it started in 1925. And then it was, you know, altered a lot in the 40s and 50s. And in the 70s, it yeah. was altered completely Huge. when a lot of development came to town. So. We could sort of make a timeline about that, and that might be interesting to people. Mm -hmm. um, and the you know zoning, uh, the zoning map changed completely. Um, so you know, describing in general how things got to where they are, I think we could definitely do that. Yeah, I don't want to create more work, but I just it's always something I'm in the back of my mind of is, is how do we get here, sort of thing. I agree with Jack's point, and I not want to suck up a whole lot of resources but I think doing that timeline mm. could actually be used over and over again in like public presentations or forums or whatever it would be informative just do you know when was the last time the last overhaul did happen of the bylaw like was it the uh, 70s I think it was the 70s yeah okay. yeah it was yeah. the 70s yeah yikes um, Janet so I'm hoping that two weeks um, of a delay to get some more information about how other, like Northampton handled it, how Somerville handled it, um, what process they put together wouldn't be, I understand it's a very urgent situation, but I, I think that we could wait a few weeks and digest a little bit some more information about different options. Like even you said that you used a steering committee in one town and the town attorney in the other, and I'm wondering, okay, which was better process, for, you know, what was more effective? Um, I know Northampton has gone through this again. You know, they're, they're doing big changes, and I would like to know more information how they set that up and how they did that, and then, you know, the Somerville process, too. Um, I just want to have a, a menu of choices because this one just seems like, oh, let's go, and I don't think there is a common vision, even on the board. I think we see the common need for changes in the bylaw. Um, I'm not, I, I just need to know what the process is and what the goals are and what are the options of how to proceed. And I understand your sense of urgency, especially about the sign, but I just, I think we should wait two weeks and get some more information and reflect a little bit about more than an hour on overhauling the zoning bylaw. Sure. So, I, you know, a big part of the work is um, figuring out how we're going to display this new bylaw, how we're going to redesign it, structure it, um, format it. That's going to be a, quite a bit of work on its own. 
we need to get ourselves to a point where we're talking about identifying the items we need the vision for and we need you. We need the planners to come in here and meet with you and talk about that to give direction to how the language develops. I don't think I'm going to do anything in the next two weeks that you're asking for that'll be useful. And maybe, maybe that's something that you can work on as this process goes forward and be prepared to give direction to how that language gets developed as part of the planning process, as part of that visioning. I, I'm, not sure that, I'm not sure I'd be able to do much in the next two weeks. Um, I, I feel like you can take a vote to support the effort without knowing what all the details are gonna be. And there's a lot of time to collect more data and more information and investigate how other cities and towns have done this. But it doesn't mean that you don't think that this effort should go forward in some form. So I would encourage you to support this now and we'll kind of work on the details as we go forward. Uh, Michael? Um, I hope my comment a minute ago didn't get misinterpreted. I'm in no way against this, the idea of moving forward quickly with this process. Um, and uh, I hope you didn't misunderstand me. Um, all I was trying to say earlier was that it is important for the success of this project that public buy-in be substantial uh, without knowing how to define that exactly. That means somehow figuring out a mechanism by which the public is consistently informed, one, but two, more importantly, listened to as opposed to simply being informed. Uh, too, much of the, of, of the doc, uh, too much of the dialogue between the town and the citizens uh, is related to the town telling the, the, town telling the citizens what, they, what the, is going on. We need to have more in the other direction. And I, I really hope that this process, which is absolutely important and should be proceed, pr pursued quickly, uh, has that kind of uh, aspect to it. Thank you. Um, Janet? Could we just wait on this vote for two weeks and get, collect some more information and reflect a bit? I'm Is there another member who would like to wait for another two weeks or so? I, I don't. So um, at this point, if there's more questions, I'll, I'll oh. take them. Yep, David? I, I think that, again, uh, to <clears throat> echo Chris's earlier comments, I think that encouraging with a vote to start the ball rolling does not in any way, I think Janet, mean that, you know, any work that anyone does to go, hey, here was what happened there, um, won't, won't it be helpful, especially early days. But I think that just the um, I think that what Mr. Moore is looking for is just the encouragement to start and will with the confidence that we'll haltingly figure it out as we go along. Um, does do the members want to take a vote or talk about this more or table it or I move the previous question. Okay. Um, a show of hands in favor. I see six. Uh, no. And abstain. Okay. Thank you. I hope that helps. We're it looking does. forward to you coming back, and we'll see you at Zoning Subcommittee. Sounds good. Thank you. Nice job on that. Redesign there. Rob, you, you were critical. You were influential in this. Thank you. <laughs> You're critical. <laughs> he designed it and built it. Yeah. And built it. There you go. <laughs> um, so I'm going to move to item uh, B of the zoning bylaw update and rewrite. Yeah. Do, uh, that's great. Um, is that all right, Amherst Media? We're just going to take a four minute break? Okay. Great. Thank you. Oh. We're going on to item um, four, I think. <laughs> item B, discussion of proposed draft zoning bylaw amendment process. So we do have um, 
a proposed flow chart for zoning bylaw amendments in our packet um, with some backup information behind it on reasoning why um, the flow chart looks the way it is. Um, Ms. Bestrup, do you have a introduction on this item? Um, I can give a quick rundown on, on this uh, process here. Um, it's really not too different from the process that the planning board used when we had a town meeting form of government, but we will be interacting with the CRC at various points along the way. So um, I'll just start at the top of the page. Um, the town council starts the process, and uh, that's when they receive a bylaw amendment from either the planning board who's been working on it, or a councilor might submit something, or town staff or a resident who is submitting a petition. Um, once the council receives a zoning amendment, they pass it on to the planning board and to the CRC, the Community Resources Committee of the town council. And then the CRC and the planning board get started. So once the planning board receives the um, amendment, uh, well, excuse me, it has to, the, the town council has to pass it on to the planning board within 14 days of receiving it. So that's part of the time frame. Um, it says the deadline is directory, not mandatory, which means that you, if you don't f uh, follow that direction, you, it's not a fatal flaw, but it's um, well recommended. And this starts the 65 days in which the planning board has to hold a public hearing. So if the planning board is initiating something, you wouldn't really send it to town council unless you were pretty sure you were ready to hold a public hearing on it. You wanted to have it pretty solidly drafted. So the town uh, planning board re receives the, um, the document and then starts the review process, um, including whomever they think would be an appropriate body to review it with. Uh, presumably the zoning subcommittee would be the most appropriate body, but presumably the zoning subcommittee has seen it already. Um, meanwhile, the CRC is keeping in touch with the planning board and making sure that they know what is going on, what's being proposed, and try to understand it. The CRC will send feedback to the planning board if they think that would be useful. Um, then the planning board, uh, once it decides it wants to hold its public hearing, it needs to post a notice within 14 days and send that notice to cities and towns and the DHCD, the Department of Housing and Community Development, and the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and all the planning boards for the surrounding towns. We have to hold it within 65 days, like I've initially said. And then um, we have to publish it 14 days in advance of the public hearing, and then usually about seven days in advance of the public hearing. Um, so one unique thing about having this town council form of government is that uh, we, the town council has made a decision that they think it would be a good idea if the CRC and uh, the planning board held a joint public hearing. The town council is required to hold a public hearing on zoning amendments, and they're designating the CRC as their body to act in their behalf to hold a public hearing. So why hold two public hearings? Why have CRC hold one and the planning board hold one? Why don't we get together on that? So that's what this middle section where the two large um, boxes are. Then the planning board does its final review and revise um, whatever is, is being considered. And the planning board votes on the proposed amendment with input from CRC and submits a final report to town council. Now, that's the same as the final report that we used to submit to the town meeting. And um, often the planning board members would take a role in doing that, um, but often staff would also do that. I, I'm looking at Maria because she wrote a few of these reports. Um, and then once we submit our final report to town council, then it's really up to them to work through their process. The CRC will vote to recommend, uh, to make a recommendation to town council, and they will forward the zoning amendment to the GOL. And I'm afraid I don't remember what that, those. Uh, Government Organization and Legislation Committee. And that's part of the charter that the GOL needs to um, review and, and act on this. So the GOL finalizes its review and votes. And a town, the town attorney obviously reviews all of these things. We want to make sure that they comport with, town, with the state law. 
Um, then the GOL passes this on to town council for a first reading. Then the town council does its second reading and votes. And the vote must be held within 90 days of the CRC public hearing. So um, this uh, process seems very complicated, but it's really not. We went through a process very similar, except I don't think we had CRC back in the summer when we repealed the old zoning bylaw and replaced it with the zoning bylaw that we have today. The zoning bylaw that we have today reflects all of the changes that were required by the town charter. So we've been through this process once before. Um, we work with the town clerk and the um, CRC and the town council to make sure that we do everything correctly, but it's not as complicated as it seems. So does anyone have any questions? Michael. Um, before we get to the, the box at the top of the page, uh, if the zoning amendment originates from the planning board, we've been through the zoning subcommittee and the planning board before it is before box the top box. Now, are we? St we're not holding public hearings at that point. The, the, the zoning subcommittee is essentially writing a new bylaw amendment and zoning bylaw amendment, and the planning board is approving that without any real public hearing. Is that correct? All zoning subcommittee meetings and all planning board meetings are public no. meetings. So the I public understand that, but not a, not, a, not a public hearing as, as it's defined. There isn't any public hearing until further down the line, but if the planning board feels that they want to hold a meeting that would be focused on a particular topic, a yeah. particular zoning amendment, they can hold a separate planning board meeting and invite the public specifically for that purpose. So that might be something that you want to consider doing. Did we not, uh, when back in the old town meeting days, did we not hold public hearings prior to submitting the, um, on, a, on a zoning amendment, prior to submitting it to town meeting? So it was a little bit different back in the old days. What um, generally happened was that things were initiated by the planning board, the planning board held a public hearing, and then passed it on to the select board to put it on the warrant. That's not exactly the way it should have gone, according to Hoyle, if you will. Um, it should have gone to the select board and the select board should have passed it back to the planning board. I've spoken with our town attorney about that and he said that a lot of cities and towns, or yeah, cities and towns miss that step. Um, they don't go upstairs and then have it come back down again. Um, they just start it at the planning board level. The planning board holds the public hearing, then it goes up to be put on the warrant. So it is true that um, we, did hold public hearings prior to submitting something to the select board in the old days, but in this rendition, we're not gonna be doing that. We're gonna be holding public meetings. Then after it goes to the town council and comes back to you, then you'll hold your public hearing. Okay, thank you. That makes it much clearer because I was thinking about the old way and the fact that we did have public hearings, uh, official public hearings before we went to town meeting. Mandy, um Joe, she, um, I think, worked a lot on this. And how it was described to me is there's, you know, two different ways. But if it's created in the zoning subcommittee um, and then it's this planning board review process, it's going back and forth between, like, zoning subcommittee and planning board. And then planning board's like, oh, we think this is pretty much ready to go sort of like what we used to do before town meeting. We were like, oh yeah, this is getting close. This is probably ready. She was saying at that time we would send uh, like a memo to town council at the top saying we have something that's pretty much ready to go. And then that's their trigger to sort of think about, well, do, are they ready to receive it right in this moment? Or Because one of the questions I had concerns is that you know, the way it was is twice a year we had town meeting. You had it in the spring and we had it in the fall and it really created a heavy rhythm for planning board but also for staff. They knew, we, we always knew when it was about a month before town meeting because Chris would kind of be like, okay, I, I, everybody, I gotta start focusing and getting this stuff ready for town meeting. But what could happen with this is I don't think the intention is that 
every little bylaw either coming from people or coming from us would be in constant, like, because this could be constantly going and constantly being fed to CRC and town council and have multiple ones going on at the same time at different stages, which would be awful. So I had just asked, I don't know if there was any more discussion about it, but, you know, maybe it doesn't say this in this flow chart, but maybe it will be only like three or four times a year or something. I have no idea, but so that they would collect them a little bit. So we would tell them from zoning subcommittee, we've got one that's ready, one that's almost ready, whatever, and they would start to prepare how they were gonna initiate this flow chart. And that it isn't just always like an open door to start like every week of the year. Does that, did you follow any of that? No, I, I, I've been following the CRC and I'm following it now. I'm, I'm actually more confused. So, so, so zoning subcommittee, we have, a, we actually have a bunch of things in the batch. And so, you know, say we decided, okay, you know, even though we have this other process going, let's do the mixed use building and whatever. And so we could say to the planning board, you know, vote, you know, like it's time for a public hearing, like, you know, talk to the planning board, planning board says, yeah, it's ready to go. Then we have to send it back to the town council and then they send it back so we can have the formal public hearing? Exactly. Because that could go on, that, you know, because I, I kind of thought that the process would be the planning board would hold the public, the formal public hearing, send it off to the town council and they can just batch it and decide what they do with it. They don't, there's no time constraints on their part. We could just keep on working stuff, sending it to them and they can decide, okay, we're gonna focus on zoning in, you know, whatever. So. I'm a little confused, so it seems like our, the timing of the formal hearing is really triggered by the town I, council. I, I hear you. So part of it is if, if zoning subcommittee working on it and then you think, oh, it's ready to at least go to a planning board, and of course all of our meetings are public, you know, so it's announced, it's on the agenda, it comes to planning board and then planning board talks about it, either says, oh yeah, you're right, this is perfect, or uh, no, what, have you thought about this, this, and this? And it goes back to zoning subcommittee. And then we could take a vote just that we think it's ready to go to town council. And then it would go up to town council. And then it, then it starts this process. So part of the thought of having the joint hearing is it's it twofold. One, it helps the public so they don't get confused and show, you know, like it's one meeting and it's broadly announced so people who are following um, CRC or town council might know about it or people who are plan following planning board, they might know about it and they come and it's streamlined so that members of the public don't feel like they have to come to two different meetings to voice their opinion and they can just come once. The other part is if you start sending it, if we just cook it and we're like, yay, it's done and we kick it off to CRC, well, right away, if they haven't been involved enough in the process and have another meeting with other people coming and bringing things up, it's just setting up that process where they're going to have to keep sending it back to us. So we're trying to reduce some of that, send it back to planning board by doing it together so we're all hearing sort of the same stuff. Because we haven't approved it yet. If you notice the red box is further down below yeah, yeah. the joint hearing. So potentially after that joint hearing, it could go back to zoning subcommittee to get like a little more finessed or tweaked and then continue on again. Okay, so that, so I sort of get that better. Okay. And so then once we have the joint hearing and the planning board, we decide this is fantastic. <laughs> and then we send it off. We've had, you know, we've had our formal joint hearing. We think it's fantastic. We send it off to the CRC. And I assume at that point we sort of just have no control over it, right? And so the CRC could say, we like most of it, we want to amend it. They could probably, I don't know if they have the power to do the amendments and then they go to the council, maybe they send it back to us. So, so at some point we just hand it off and just shake hands and say, good luck, we hope it passes. And then obviously be involved with the reporting and presenting. presenting. So but the, the town council has the authority to amend it and decide what the final looks like. So there is a handoff. I, it's not too different from the way it worked in the old days after the planning board held their public hearing and they wrote their report to town meeting. Um, it would go to the warrant review committee and the warrant review committee would put it on the warrant and then the moderator would say, oh, 
this is a problem. You better fix this. So we would work on fixing whatever wording needed to be fixed. And then sometimes when it got even farther along, until it got to the final warrant, it could be adjusted. So, you know, there's always that opportunity. And then even on the floor of town meeting, we didn't think this was a good idea, but on the floor of town meeting, mm -hmm. things changed. So I'm sure that once they get to town council, there's the possibility that if there's something wrong with what's being proposed, things will change. So it's not like it's, you know, locked yeah. in or carved in stone or something. So they could refer back a little, but you have to remember there's time, like, so this is a flow chart. It's not a timeline, which also shows you a different criteria that hold it in. You know, you have like, like it says in the bottom box, vote must be held within 90 days of the CRC public hearing. So that's yet another reason why they're trying to tag in tightly what we're hearing and seeing and working on and what CRC is updated on. Because, you know, it can go back and forth to us, but not that much because we're working under um, this built-in time frames. I also think that once it gets to town council, town council can vote to agree with it and adopt it, or they can vo vote it down, or they can vote to send it back to the planning board for more work. And so just like the, class. the town meeting used to do, you know, they can send it back if they don't feel like they can adopt it at that time. Oh, Maria, go ahead. Um, I don't want to discuss this item tonight, but I just want to pose the question to ask either the CRC or town council, could they give us a sense of the bundling of this? Like, do they want to see six at a time, two at a time? Like, just to, for us to sort of know path moving forward, like for the zoning subcommittee and planning board, like how we should sort of target our sort of work ahead. So, um, but I don't want to discuss it. I just, whoever's in, cahoots with the CRC and town council. That we do can, have some CRC here. Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> so yeah. they're listening. So it'd be great to yeah get a sense of that so we can know how to move forward. Okay. Yeah, and, and how they would want to do it the first run. Like, do they just want one, something kind of simple? Do you want to test it one time and then, then how to bundle it? And if they are giving thought to how often, like, would it be quarterly or something like that? Um, because I know there could be other amendments that come from other sources too, that, so it's not just us. Um, any other questions? Um, so I'm not sure what CRC wants. I wasn't gonna get you involved in this, but I'm not, you know, we're looking at it. We've given a little feedback. I, I appreciate um, the questions and I've gotten them down. Yeah, do you wanna come up either you can say no state, you know, we'll get back to you, or do you yeah, want to come up? Yeah, basically we'll get back to you. Okay. So at this point, this is all we have to do. Are there any other last thoughts that you want to send to them? Yeah. Yeah. Um, They're all appreciated. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would like to see uh, a series of boxes above the first box, which says, um, which is, recognizes the fact that uh, many zoning amendment proposals will come th from the planning board directly through the, Z for, through the zoning subcommittee and that's that's the uh, and that should come before town council receives it seems to me um, because I think that would make clear that uh, the the planning board and perhaps the zoning subcommittee We'll have to be dealing with these things, these amendments, on at least two occasions uh, after we think they're finished, uh, which seems to me to be too often. Um, and um, unnecessary uh, from both our point of view and from the council's point of view. Um, because I think um, while there may be technical changes and there may be some uh, specific objection to proposals that come out of the planning board, and zone, the zoning subcommittee and the planning board, uh, that it's the town council's responsibility to uh, vote them down or, or uh, dismiss them if they're not appropriate. Um, so uh, rather than sending them 
back to us on a regular basis. I understand that it might happen occasionally, but rather than making that um, an assumed part of the process, uh, it would be, I think, more helpful to everybody if that were an unusual part of the process rather than the assumption. Um, I think if it's the assumption, then it simply is making more work for everybody. Uh, and I don't see the need to do that. Uh, I may be wrong, but that's my, fan, my sense. Doug, uh, was it? Chris, and Doug. So I just wanted to say that there's, um, uh, I probably didn't emphasize the right-hand side of the page that much. Um, there's an opportunity for the CRC to be involved all along the way. And one of their responsibilities is going to be um, meeting with the planning board, figuring out what the planning board is doing, and reporting to town council the whole time. So I don't really feel like something's going to get to town council without the town council having a clue about what's being proposed or not having had some opportunity to give input through this whole process, even, even before it gets to town council because we are going to have a CRC representative who's going to meet with the planning board on a regular basis. We have one already, Pat DeAngelis, who's meeting with us about master plan issues, and then the CRC is going to designate one of their other members to come and talk to us and be aware and transmit information about zoning bylaws. So there will be a lot happening before town council receives the document. Um, but I think town council will be well aware of it by the time they receive it. Well, like I said, this was just the first, oh, sorry, Doug, go ahead. It's getting late, I know. I'm like, you don't want to talk. No, I'm kidding, go ahead. <laughs> so what I was going to say, I think was just negated by what you said, Chris, um, because I was going to disagree with Michael that we needed the process after we sent it up to town council and them for that. We needed them to send it back because at that point we started to get comments from CRC and town council. I mean, they're, they're not going to want to approve anything that they think they're all going to lose their, get voted out of office for that's approving. Good. That's a good point. Right? I mean, even if we think it's the greatest sliced bread there ever was. And we're going to vote. It's the best slice of bread we're going to vote for. Well. You don't? We won't go there. No, yeah. We're not elected okay. officials. So we're not we're elected just, officials. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, earlier there was some conversation about how the public is going to be able to be involved in zoning changes. And will we have enough, will we have a process that lets us, lets enough of that come through? Well, it'll come through during the hearing and then it'll come through in scads of emails to town councilor inboxes. And, and so, I, I mean, if, if, if the, the process leading up to the top of this page doesn't include significant CRC communication, then we definitely need a place for that to happen. And th that's what this su suggests, is where it happens. I'm not sure I did anything but waste everybody's time with that, but sorry. Janet. So I think I'm just very tired, but I think what Michael was saying, and I see the need for, is to do a flow chart about what, when it starts with the planning board. So it's the, this first thing, it says town council receives proposal, proposed zoning, zoning bylaw from planning board, whatever. And I don't know if I'm just tired, but it seems that it will it'll be sort of a different process for when we are sending things up to come back again and loop around. and. It's just a little hard for me to see right now. So it might be helpful to pull that one out on a smaller chart. I think Mandy Jo did have two charts at one she point, did. and one of the charts started with the planning board, and one of the charts started with others. But in the end, it looked she like ran out of the, room. the process was exactly the same once it gets to town council. Yeah. So the planning, this is really something that we're sharing with CRC and town council about how the overall process is going to work. How the planning board process works itself is completely up to you. And it can work just the way it's always worked, which is zoning subcommittee comes up with the initiative and creates the document and then presents it to the planning board and talks to the planning board and they say, 
no, it needs more work, and then you go back to the CSC, and they work on it, and then they bring it back to the planning board. So there's a lot of back and forth between the ZSC and the planning board before it ever gets to town council. But that's not really reflected in this. You might want to do a separate flow chart that describes what the planning board oh, process is before yeah. it goes to town council. Just, uh, it, she tried and yeah. she ran out of room, but it, I don't know if anyone, because it's not really part of the flow chart, but on the bottom left above the draft box, there's one that says CRC aims for a collaborative process that includes information and feedback, sharing on potential proposals while they work their way through the planning board process prior to the process shown on this chart. So that was sort of the, and again, um, Mandy jo has been here before. She was like, I'm not gonna tell you how to do your business, and this is the zoning subcommittee and planning board's business. So that box is sort of the, yep, we've gotta figure out how we're gonna fit into their structure which is mostly mandated by various charters and law and such, which is some of it is, if you really want to get like stimulated on this, the, the back three pages are just full of details. Um, so yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say what the back three pages are. It's a book. <laughs> They're good stuff. Yeah, it, it's a book that Bob Ritchie, who used to be the a town attorney, and then was the assistant attorney general for the state, is working on with former planning director Bob Mitchell to try to make sense out of guide, uh, land use in Massachusetts. It's called the Guidebook to Massachusetts Land Use. So this is their attempt to plot the path of zoning amendments as they make their way through a city or a town council, a, ci a city council or a town process. And so this is really based on state law and that's what Mandy Jo was basing her chart on to try to hit all the requirements of state law and also to hit the requirements of the charter. And this um, chart here that Bob Ritchie and Bob Mitchell worked on is also annotated to show how it fits in with the charter. The little red writing refers to charter sections. So you have to read this with kind of an open mind and think about the state law and the charter both at the same time. But we have to meet both sets of requirements and that's what this is about. Okay. It's very detailed but it is really good. If, if you really want to know then get a good drink and um, soak it in. Um, do we, is this enough for tonight? And we'll wait for CRC to come back with more. Uh, maybe they'll even tweak this, I don't know, so. All right, thank you, thank you. Thank you for hanging out with us. <laughs> All right, we'll move to item five, master plan update. Christine Bester, planning director, progress of the master plan update. So I have been working on the master plan update and I uh, will tell you a couple of things I've done. But let me get a drink of water. <laughs> it's dry in here. So I'm starting with the land use section, which is chapter three, because that's the chapter that I know the most about. And I thought I would approach it that way and try to just get as much done on the land use chapter and then I would move on to something else. But immediately when I started, I realized I was gonna have to reach out to other people to get input from them, get information from them, you know, people who have information about demographics or land use or all the various topics that's covered by the master plan. So I wrote a pretty, what, involved email to many um, uh, department heads, including the school department and DPW and town manager, and I don't even remember all the people I wrote to, just outlining what it is we're doing and the fact that we're going to be spending six to nine months on this. And we will be reaching out to people for information, input, and help all along the way. Um, the impetus for this was that I started writing to one person and I realized that person has no idea what kind of a project this is, how long it's going to take, how many times I'm going to go back to them for same type of information. So I just sent out this email and captured what it is we're doing. I think I copied Christine Gray Mullen, but I may not have. 
So anyway, that was, that was one step that I took. Then I um, spoke with the IT department about the different ways that they can help us, and they have a tremendous amount of data available to them through our GIS system. So they're very much on board, and they're going to fit in um, our requests to them um, with all of their other work, but not feeling like they have to do it immediately. They're going to be able to you know, work over time. We also have our new um, staff member who happens to be very good at GIS. So I am asking him to work with IT to gather a lot of this information. And particularly for land use, it has to do with how much more land do we have in conservation restrictions than we had back in 2010? How much more land do we have in APR than we had in 2010? How much more land has been developed for mixed-use buildings or any number of things? There are all kinds of things that they can help us with. So they're currently getting up to speed and working on that. In the meantime, I've been going through the text of the land use section and just sort of putting in things that I know about that have happened and trying to assemble information about all the various plans. I think we have a list that Christine Gray Mullen asked me to put together a few months ago, a list of all the plans that have been um, done since 2010, so we're going to incorporate those. So little by little, um, I'm getting a handle on this, and I'm hoping to bring you um, a kind of a rough draft of Chapter 3 by the 18th of March. Of course, it'll have to be before then because you'll need to have your packets for your meeting. But um, anyway, that's, that's my goal. Um, and it's going to be rough, and I'm sure that you'll have a lot of suggestions about different ways to handle it, different information that needs to be put in. I've received some input from Mr. Levenstein, which is very helpful, things that he thinks need to be um, talked about in the master plan. And if you all have ideas about that, please send them to me. But um, I'm, I'm feeling good about it. I'm feeling like I'm on my way. Thank you. I hope the next chapter you pick is a shorter, easier one. Did um, actually none of the chapters are very short, except open space and recreation is eight pages, but um, uh, the others are all over ten pages. And land use is twenty-three pages, but that's what I do all the time. So I figured if I can't do that, I can't do the others. So that's where I started. <laughs> Thanks. Any questions for Chris? Uh, Janet. So, so um, are you thinking like? the land use chapter with the implementation section? like What I'm doing is um, I am putting in wherever we have implemented something. If we have done an action that's based on that strategy, I'm noting it and you know trying to bring people up to speed about what have we accomplished in the last 10 years. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I'm doing. Or if you know if we've done the opposite, I would mention that too. So. Um, you know, just all the different things that I know about. I've been here for 15 or 16 years now, so I've, you know, seen a lot over, the, over that time period. So, um, and, but I'm sure that you all will want to add to it or maybe change it or whatever, but that's the whole point of this process. So the other, I hate to ask something at 1025, I, I struggle to find all the plans the town has done. Can, can that all be just put on the planning department webpage or our webpage? Or both, because I, I, some, I sometimes can't remember what committee did something, and I'm always kind of fishing around. And then you would do the search, and then you come up with these odd things. So that'd be great. Thanks. Great. So we look forward to seeing the, the first draft roll out. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we'll move to item six, planning and zoning. Item A, Z, S, uh, C. Report. That's I think we've Maria. discussed everything, but I do want to add that the zoning subcommittee meetings are joint meetings with the planning board, so everyone's welcome to come in. It's going to be a lot of meaty stuff coming it's our party. way. It's Yeah. Uh, any public comment about the zoning sub? No, there's not. Okay. Other? Nothing. Uh, seven. Old business. Decision signing? I sent it out late this afternoon, and I acknowledge that you may not have had an opportunity to read it. If you don't feel comfortable reading it or signing it tonight, you can um, read it and come in and sign it later. The reason that I'm sort of rushing this is because Mr. Robleski, who was here tonight, has a special permit that you approved on February 5th. So it's taken until now to draft this decision. And he's eager to have this signed and filed with the town clerk so that he can 
um, move ahead with his project now that he's got his site plan review approval. So in any event, if you feel comfortable signing it tonight, you could do so. If not, and you want to you know, read it and then come in and sign it um, during the week, you can do that. Um, if you have any big major changes to it, I guess I have to bring it back to the planning board. But if they're just editorial you know, uh, typos or whatever. Anyway, how do you feel about signing it tonight? I'm happy to sign it tonight. Um, it's pretty short. It's so only... do you want to just pass it down and whoever can yes. wants to sign it, they can it. sign yep. it? And if you don't want to and read it, come back. When, when, is the drop, when do you want people to come back in to sign it? Um, I would like to have it signed soon because, well, I'm going to be working on the site plan review approval now that you've approved that. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, in the next week, if you can like manage by to Wednesday? do that. By or next Tuesday? Wednesday, yeah. Okay. You can manage to do so that. So try to come in before like Wednesday morning or something. So you can. Okay, great. I assume I don't need to sign it. Uh, that's right. Oh. No, this is oh, the this special is this permit. special permit. So this Sorry. is the one you yeah, want you to frame because it. it's your first. <laughs> we you all take them home and frame it now. <laughs> No, the special, the special permit you voted on, didn't you? Yeah, because we, we started it after you came. Voted on it on February 5th. It See, was a it one night. It was a blur. <laughs> it was a one night public hearing, and it was just about the little addition to the back yeah. of the White House at 462 Main Street. And everybody agreed that that was an okay thing to do. And this is a pretty skeletal decision. So. Um, so great on that. And uh, s topics not in, uh, reasonably anticipated in 48 hours prior to the meeting. I was wondering, can you give like a really short update to everybody about Amherst Hills because we've been pushing it off every week and every week and just. So um, uh, yes, I can talk it's good about news. that I don't know. if I can still talk. Um, so Jim Master Alexis, who kind of leads the group of residents. Um, approached me with a long, with a, not a long, a five question list of questions that he had for me and for town council, Joel Bard, about why things weren't moving ahead faster. So I sent that um, list to Joel Bard, who happened to be out of town at the time. And um, I offered to meet with Jim Master Alexis yesterday morning with two other members of the residential group from Amherst Hills. And it just so happened that Joel Bard was available to talk to me on the phone yesterday morning. So I spoke with him for about a half hour. And then I met with the residents. And I managed to kind of keep Joel Bard on the phone while I was <laughs> meeting with the residents. So they had a chance to talk to one another. And it was really useful because they got to understand why Joel was giving us the advice he was giving us. So in the end, what Joel advises is he thinks a covenant is really the best form of security for a subdivision. And he would recommend that the town um, consider reimposing the covenant. That's something that the applicant or the developer is actually agreeing to. But there's a question about how worthwhile the lots are that would go under the covenant. There are allegations on the part of the residents that Many of the lots aren't worth much at all because they have wetlands or they're on a road that's not developed yet. So um, what we're currently thinking, and the residents whom I met with yesterday seem to more or less agree with this plan, that um, once we get the Conservation Commission to tell us mm -hmm. what the significant wetland issues are on these lots, then I can reach out to a realtor or an appraiser or somebody and get a pretty good idea of what the lots are worth. And then the planning board can decide if that form of security is, um, is worthwhile, is what you really want. Um, Joel reminded me that a covenant doesn't allow the planning board to um, acquire the lots that are under covenant. All it does is it um, gives the developer an incentive to finish the infrastructure so that he can get the lots released so he can sell them and make some money. So if the lots aren't worth anything, there's not much incentive. But if the lots are worth something, there is incentive. So that's one um, option for the planning board to take. We won't know about 
whether that's a worthwhile option for a few months because the Conservation Commission can't determine anything about vernal pools or wetlands right now. Um, probably late April, May, something like that, this will come back to you. So the other option, and this was actually something that Jim Master Alexis brought up, was, well, maybe we're better off staying with what we have right now, which is $288,000 in a three-party agreement and um, a recommendation, strong recommendation to the building commissioner that he not release building permits on those lots, um, which has been filed at the registry. So that is something to keep the developer's feet to the fire to con continue to work on the infrastructure. So I think the residents are going to go back and talk among themselves about what they think about this. And the planning board will need to make a decision at some point a few months down the road about which option you think is more worthwhile. But it's something that you don't really need to face immediately. And I'm hoping that we'll have some good information for you late spring or early summer. Thank you for that. It's good for us to know because it was kind of hanging out there and it's good to know. Any questions or are we all good with that? Okay. Um, Eight, new business, item A, discussion and potential vote to move planning board meeting to 630. So um, this is something our new member had suggested and I think we all went home and thought about it. Uh, what are the thoughts here? Are people up for moving to 630 or do they want to keep it at 7? Any strong preferences? David? Um, if we move to 630 and we continue to meet till 11 o'clock, then uh, so, so uh, I, I mean, it defeats the purpose. Is there a way in which we can consider this as well as putting like a limit to the, because they're, they're just relevant. Um, and I, I can't concentrate anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Zoning Board of Appeals has been known to put an upper limit on their meetings. Sometimes they come into a meeting and the chair will say, we're not meeting past 9 o'clock or whatever the hour is. And they really stick to it. So it, that's an option for you to consider. If, if we do that, then we probably ought to put a time frame on each item on the yeah. agenda. Item 4, 10 minutes. Item 5, <laughs> 35 minutes, something like that. I think. May I, if I may, what happens is you just don't get to the other things that yeah. are on the agenda. You just postpone them to the next time. So, so would people consider like six to nine? I mean, I could I could meet at six thirty or six. I just don't know how we're just going to cut things. Uh, you know, I mean, to cut at nine, I think. So I did a little research and looked at minutes of other towns' planning boards, and I felt good. First of all, our agendas are light, and a lot of them go to like 11 o'clock or later. I was horrified. Um, I was like looking at brain trees. And, and another point is, in general, there are five people, um, but they still go long. Because I was thinking, like, I always knew we were a larger board than most towns. The average is five. And I thought, oh, well, maybe ours go longer because there's more people to talk, you know? And, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and when I looked at the ones that were going late, they just have a lot. Like, believe it or not, like more, think about these towns around Boston that they just have so many special permits and, and site plan review that they're just totally loaded. And um, I mean, we already meet twice a month. Sometimes we meet three times a month. I will say I, by Three hours, I, I really want to be done, and three and a half, I feel, is a max. Like, right now, I'm feeling crispy. I, I, if we moved it to 6.30, that's 6.30, 7.30, 8.30, 9.30. I mean, it, we could end 10, maybe, is a, is a drop-dead date uh, time for us dropping dead. Or, you know, but go ahead. I wonder if we could just try it once and see if we do finish at 10, or is it still going till 10.30? Just give it a test run, or is that? Do we have to like officially post it? And okay, I'm I'm just wondering if it does make a difference or not. I'm willing to meet at 6:30 if it means we can leave at 10 or earlier. 
Yeah, I'm willing to do the 6.30 just to take a little off the, you know. The truth is we haven't gone past 10 that many nights. Like, it's just recent. I know. And I think it's just because we have so many, we have initiatives now along with um, our regular business of, of permits. But I don't know, what do you think, Chris? Because this is your realm too. Well, I think it would be easy to try it. If you decided on a date, then any public hearing that came on that date, we would just um, make that the time for starting the public hearing. So you should tell us if you want to try it, what date do you want to try it on? I think there are three meetings in April, the 1st, the 15th, and the 29th. So you could choose one of those. Or you could choose the 18th of March. We, I'm willing to try it right away. I, I, we can do it on the 18th and... We have a tree hearing scheduled for 7.05, but we could do our other business before the tree hearing mm -hmm. if you want to start the meeting at 6.30. Sure. I mean, does everyone want to just try it? So what do you do? Just announce, like, do we have to have a special announcement or just posting it's good enough even though it's always been seven and, it, okay. I think I was going to give an update on the master plan that day. So we could start on that update okay. and then go to the public hearing at 7.05 and then go back to the update. So on the agenda or something, can you make sure you like bold the, the new time or maybe even draw an, uh, like a, put a little parentheses like new time or something like that so that, yeah, just so people might notice. Um, the 18th. We're gonna do 6.30 on the 18th. Um, how does that agenda look so far? Like I knew tonight would be bad, but. And it looks pretty light. It's just, um, so far it's the tree hearing for trees on Leverett Road. It's signing of Mr. Robleski's special okay, site plan great. review, if I can get that done. And um, it's me talking about the master plan. Wow. And an that A and That sounds like the old days. Okay. A and R. So let's start at 6.30. We might be done. Yes, sir. 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 You do need a site visit, yes. Okay. So you'll be sending stuff out on that. All right, so at this point, we'll just change the next meeting to 6.30 and see how that feels. Um, any other topics not reasonably anticipated? New business? N nothing. Okay, uh, nine, Form A, a and R, subdivision applications. Oh, awesome. Uh, upcoming ZBA applications that we need to hear about? Okay, good. Um, 11, upcoming SPP, SPR, uh, SUB, uh, nothing. Um, committee reports, does anyone have a committee report? Michael? CPAC is finalizing its recommendations Great. to town council tomorrow, I think, uh, and in which case I will report the uh, outcome to you all at the following meeting. Thank you. Um, any other committee reports? Nope, I see none. Report of the chair, none. Report of staff? Glad that it's nighttime and we're all going home. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Have a nice night. Adjournment. Do I hear a motion? Someone? Yeah. We're adjourning at 1040. Second. Done. Thank you. Thank you, Amherst Media.